Hello and welcome back guys. Glad to see you still around. Kofi link in the description if you be so kind to support. Make yourselves comfortable and enjoy. This is Book of the Dead. Chapter 56. It was minute, so tiny were it any smaller it couldn't be said to exist at all. A fleck of arcane energy that drifted on imperceptible paths until, suddenly, it winked out of existence. Or did it? No. There it was. A seemingly new speck ever so imperceptibly larger than the previous, had now appeared, but elsewhere. Was it the same one? Or had the old died to make way for the new, sacrificing itself for that sliver of growth? Tyron leaned closer though it didn't help. It was with magic that he sensed the minute changes of energy within the bones before him. Even so, he felt the proximity made a difference. Come on now, he whispered. There it was again. Another shift occurred, a vanishing on one side, a reappearance on the other, an insignificant growth appearing once more. It was strange to say it, but this really was magic to Tyron. Casting spells was like constructing a building, the means and methods were known, the materials reliable and understood. They could be employed gracefully, even artfully, but ultimately it was construction all the same. But this, this was unknown, this was mysterious. The process of taking that which was strange and breaking it down to something that was understood was intoxicating. New materials, new tools to work with. A fundamental shift in what was possible and what was not. The strange new wonders he could create if he were to extract even a fraction of usable knowledge from this investigation, were almost beyond imagining. Impossible towers of arcane majesty, spells that pushed into territory once thought to be fanciful and impossible. A glittering bridge made of glass. A castle formed on an unyielding foundation of air. Who knew, for the moment, it was simply tiny bubbles of death magic vanishing in one place and growing in another. But he hoped it could become much, much more. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. He chuckled as he continued to lean over the collection of bones in front of him. One step at a time. It's fucking creepy when you talk to the bones. You know that, right? The strange, detached voice of Dove rang out from his right. His concentration disturbed. The young necromancer leaned back and turned, frustration written on his features. Dove, I'm also talking to Bones when I speak to you, aren't I? He pointed out. That's true. The skull sat proudly atop the open pages of a book, the glowing orbs within its eyes, the only sign of the spirit confined within. A proud silver-ranked slayer, a summoner, forger of contracts with celestial beings from the astral sea, reduced to a ghost bound within his own remains. By the by, I'm not sure if you ever explained why you stuck me in just my skull. Not that I'm complaining all right I am, but it'd be fucking nice to have, you know, hands and legs. Nice things to have, hands and legs. Don't get me started. Tyron pressed the heels of both hands into his temples as he fought off a headache. It wasn't just Dove's irritating patter, but rather the long hours of concentration he'd put into his latest test. Dove, I'm sure I explained this several times, he said. I was able to stick your spirit into the skull. But I had, and still have, no idea how to connect it to the rest of your limbs in a way that would give you control. I have no idea how to bind mana to more than a single object, full stop. The fact I managed to do it at all is... A miracle? Yeah, yeah. You are big on blowing your own horn, kid. Anyone ever tell you that? You should stop at any rate. Blowing yourself is extremely bad for your health. You'll go blind. Surely you were living proof that's not the case. Oh. Ho, oh, firing back are we? What happened to the timid little mage boy I first met outside of Woodsedge? A pause ensued as Tyron began to reflect on that question, but before he could say anything, Dove interjected once more. Don't you dare say he died. That would be so fucking cliche I'd have to manifest some guts just so I could puke. Are you kidding me? Not to mention you're a necromancer. The dramatic irony alone would force me to kill you and then myself. Again. Fair enough, Tyron shrugged. He glanced longingly down at his experiment before he sighed and turned away. He didn't actually have to observe the process, merely measure it after another five hours had passed. Even so, he enjoyed watching it. Measuring the outcome was one thing, but understanding why it happened the way it did was another entirely, and something he was no closer to finding an answer to. He walked over to the book sitting atop the fairly flat rock that served as Dove's throne, and collected the skull in one hand. How's it looking? Dove asked. 
promising. I've been able to confirm the phenomenon. Even if only two small bones are placed together, this process begins to take place. Small flakes of death magic appear, then begin to pass back and forth between them, growing stronger in microscopic increments along the way. The more bones there are together, the quicker the process starts, and the faster it accelerates. The interesting part is where the death magic comes from in the first place, mused the skull as Tyron carried him back toward the cookpot. It can't just spontaneously appear out of nowhere, it has to be converted from ambient energy. I agree, but we don't know how that can occur naturally, without outside influence. We change magic all the time when we cast spells, but that's a manual process with our wills to guide it. Is there an outside influence? Is there something inherent within the remains that causes the magic to change? It's not like death magic is just floating around everywhere. It's always found in places associated with the dead. Hence our working hypothesis. Right. There is something inherently magical about the dead. Some spark or influence that causes the energy around them to change. Once the process starts, it accelerates until the bodies or bones become fully saturated. And that's how natural undead are caused. I'd love to know how skeletons form their musculature in the wild, Dove said. Are you kidding me? My fingers ache constantly. If I didn't have to do the threading myself it'd save a hell of a lot of time. Neither mentioned the opportunity they'd had to witness the process themselves. When Tyron had gotten carried away and left two full sets of bones laid out beside each other in one of his tests, then passed out from exhaustion as the process continued. When he finally woke, he found the skeletons had been smashed to pieces, his own minions standing protectively around him. After monitoring the process close to its completion, he'd lost consciousness at the precise moment the final transformation had begun. If his own undead hadn't intervened, he'd have died to uncontrolled wild skeletons of his own creation. He decided to halt any experiments that dealt with creating fully realized undead, until it could be done under safer conditions. His current store of bones had been separated and packed away where they couldn't interact with each other much. Just to be sure, he still checked on them daily. He placed Dove down on a new rock, one of the few that circled the still smoldering fire, and performed a role as serviceable, if uncomfortable seats. After a quick stir, he pulled up a ladle full of stew and served himself before he sat down. How old is that stew, kid? Dove asked. Tyron stared deep into the ready, brown muck in his bowl as he thought. Two days. The rising tilt of his voice made it more a question than a statement. Maybe don't eat it. Watching you decompose after dying from endlessly shitting yourself isn't exactly high on my list of things to do once you're dead. It's fine. The younger man scoffed before he tucked in. He winced. It tastes like shit, but it's fine. You're the one who cooked it, kid. You're only mocking yourself. That was true. Tyron was the only member of the group who still had to eat. Dove being a skull and your being what she was. You know my aunt and uncle ran an inn. I used to drop into the kitchen and get a hot, fresh plate of whatever they had on the go whenever I wanted. Aunt Meg could cook, that's for sure. Highest skill level in town. Pa. I've been in the capital. The food there makes what your auntie served up look like pig swill, after it's been recycled through the arse of a pig. Piss off it does, he scoffed. Then he took another spoonful. Tell you what, pig swill doesn't sound half bad right about now. Luckily for him, his constitution was so high he likely wouldn't suffer any adverse effects, even if the stew had gone bad. One of the benefits of being in Necromancer. The class made sure you were tough enough to survive the deprivation that came from living with it. Any idea where yours is? He said after forcing down another mouthful. I thought she was supposed to be back yesterday. She was. I suspect she might have been a little more thorough than the task may have called for. The two shared a look. I mean she tortured the shit out of them, Dove said helpfully. I know what you mean, Dove. Blood and bone. I don't need you to rub it into my face. The necromancer pushed a hand through his dark hair as he stared at the coals, a gloom settling over him. The idea of something that he had summoned to this realm causing that kind of pain and suffering didn't sit well with him. Not at all. But what was he to do about it? He couldn't send her back. He didn't know how. He couldn't defeat her in battle. Of that he was quite confident. He'd seen the speed she could move at. 
Perhaps after he'd advanced his class, he was close now. He only needed a few more things to fall into place. Ever since they'd left Woodsedge three weeks ago, he'd worked tirelessly to prepare himself for the change. It was imperative that he raise his core skills to 10 before he reached level 20. That was the basics of proper class advancement, everyone knew that much. Until corpse preparation, corpse appraisal and raise dead had been mastered. He simply refused to progress. Even the time pressure that bore down on him like a bell tolling his death, he wouldn't compromise on this. He couldn't. What did it matter if he reached level 20 if he only had suboptimal choices, stunting his potential from that point onward? That would be one step forward, three steps back. I'll talk with Yor when she gets back, he decided. She can't keep doing as she pleases. What pleases me may be beyond your understanding, dearest. The cool voice of the vampire came from outside the cave, and soon her perfect form could be seen approaching from the darkness, a large burden slung over her shoulder. Once she reached the fire she flung the corpse down without ceremony, flicking dirt from her shoulder with a suffering expression. I do hope you graduate from cave dwelling at some point soon, Tyron. This is a phase that I shall soon tire of. Hey, if that's the case, I have some great news for you. Dove enthused. As it so happens, you have the option, and this might sound wild to fuck off back to where you came from, literally any time you want. How amazing is that? I still don't know why I haven't extinguished that guttering filth you call a soul. Human. Shut up, both of you. Tyron had placed his food aside to stand and approach the body Yor had brought back. More experienced in the practice than he'd ever thought he might be. The necromancer passed his eyes over the body as he shifted it, inspecting each limb, the coloration of the skin, even checking the condition of the teeth. A man, malnourished, probably in his mid-twenties. Calloused hands suggested regular manual labor, and the missing teeth suggested either terrible dental hygiene, or this individual got into a lot of fist fights and sucked at it. There were no obvious wounds on him, certainly none that would have caused his death. Interestingly, there was actually a cut on his leg that looked as if it had been badly infected. Without treatment, that alone might have killed him. The other notable thing about the body was the total lack of blood. He'd been completely exsanguinated. Again, he asked. Yor raised one elegant brow as she looked down at him, crouch above the corpse. I have to eat, she stated. You can't expect me to starve myself to death for these. She gestured creatures. They aren't creatures. They're people, Tyron said, his chest tight. They are food. And before you complain, we agreed. Do you not recall? It is too late to regret your bargain now. The words fell on him like a hammer, and he sagged, the anger draining out of him. You're right. I agreed. If I'm being honest, kid, you're taking this a little too hard. These were dead men no matter what. You need to harden up, and that's the fucking truth, Dove said. They were right. He knew they were right. He just needed time to adjust his thinking. That was all. He couldn't go from a regular person to such a casual view of murder overnight. At least the mayor will be happy. He sighed. I don't think that prick has been happy his entire life, Dove remarked. I've seen doorknobs with more personality. I must agree, Yor sniffed. Now if you please, I will go to cleanse myself. Well, another set of bones to work with if nothing else. Another bandit to add to the pile. No longer feeling hungry, he tidied up his plate and emptied out the cookpot. In the morning he would need to wash it out more thoroughly. But he wasn't going to drag it down to the stream in the dark. With nothing else to do he fetched his butcher's tools and prepared to work. Hey, kid. No. Come on. You can't tell me you aren't curious. Dove, I am not taking you to peek at your while she washes. You really suck sometimes, Tyron. You know that. Chapter 57. You sure you got them all? Ten was what you asked for, ten is what you've got. Mr. Allop, the gruff and balding mayor of Ridgerton, knuckled his moustache and nodded slowly. Thar's true, he said, I'll be thanking you then. Though I can't see how you did it. Tyron looked down at the row of ten skulls on the ground, before turning back to the mayor. Mr. Allop, I'm fairly sure you don't want to know. There was a hint of fear in the man's eyes as he nodded once more. Right ye are. Here's ye yeah, pay. Is all there. He held out a small cloth bag that jingled pleasantly with coin. One that Tyron was happy to receive. I still need supplies. He said as he tucked the pouch into his belt. Any chance I can spend my newfound wealth in the village. He tried to employ a disarming smile. 
the type he'd seen Worthy use so often with truculent customers. It probably made him look constipated, but it was worth a shot. To his relief, the mayor readily agreed. Folks will be mighty pleased for it. Coins tied about now. No doubt. After the break wiping out the villages further east, cutting off trade, the bandits had squeezed what little these people had left. In a way, Tyron sympathized with the criminals. Farmers who'd lost crops, laborers with no way to pay for food, transporters who'd lost home and family while out on delivery. What options did these people have? For some, the choice had been simple, theft or death. The same choice ultimately. If Tyron hadn't gotten them, someone else would have eventually. At least this way, the remains could be put to good use. With a cloak on, he moved amongst the town and freely dispensed the coin he'd received from the mayor. He didn't haggle on prices, even though a few overcharged him. In exchange, he took food, blankets, a few cookery items, a change of clothes, some rope, and any other traveling supplies he might need for the next few weeks. He had no need of the money they paid to remove the thieves plaguing them, considering the wealth he'd taken from the ruins of Woodsedge. Much better that he exchange it for things he needed and put the coin back into the struggling community. Though they trusted him little, they were more than happy to part with odds and ends, and get the silver back in their hands. When it was all said and done, he shook the mayor's hand and departed, his goods on his back, and little fear he'd be robbed. They thought he killed ten men, after all. It took him an hour to get back to the cave. The light still shone, though weakly as he ducked his head under the low opening, and made his way inside. After navigating a few turns, he found the camp much as he left it, Dove sleeping on a rock and Jaw sleeping wherever she slept. At least the skeletons were awake. How are we, squad? He asked the ten minions, fully aware that they couldn't answer back. They existed in the back of his mind, a tiny knot of connections that bound them to him, allowed him to transmit his thoughts, and allowed them to sustain themselves on his magic. He'd felt that link so constantly now, he almost didn't remember what it felt like to be without it. It was like a warm blanket, a reliable presence that could be depended on. He was starting to see why Dove argued so strongly in favor of summoners and the like. Be they astral beings or mindless undead. It was good to know you had allies on your side. He didn't know how much sleep Dove required in his current form, but he decided to let the summoner rest. In silence, he commanded his minions to help him pack the camp, dousing the embers, tidying the belongings, packing his bedroll away. By the time your walked into view as if stepping from a shadow, he was almost done. I trust our business has been concluded in this place, she asked. All done. Payment collected, goods purchased. Did you find a suitable dress? Tyron shook his head, apologetic. Sorry y'all. The people out here don't have much. Coming across something that you would deem appropriate will be difficult. She nodded, disappointed, but understanding. It is a pity your realm has so small an understanding of my kind. There are places where kings and queens would rush to fill my every desire, upon simply learning that I was present. I suppose you could make more vampires while you were here, Tyron said. If you were inclined to do so, she looked at him sideways. Permission is required to bring another into the fold. Doubly so, for one of my blood. For the court to have any sway here at all, a vampire presence is required, but is clearly still operating in the shadows. It is often done this way. The court likes to rule openly with an iron fist, but also enjoys pulling strings from behind the curtain. It appears the latter approach has been employed here was a secret cabal of vampires calling the shots. With everything that had happened to him lately, Tyron wouldn't be surprised. Well, it's time for us to move on. Once I'm finished packing, I'm planning on heading down to the plains. Get some hunting done, work on a few things. Are you going to travel with us this time? Or would you rather make your own arrangements? How the vampire got from place to place, Tyron had no idea. But she did it very quickly and very quietly. It seemed as if she wanted to preserve her secrets. However, since she remained assiduously hidden from view as they traveled. After Tyron had set up camp, she would swan into view, not a hair out of place, and sit down by the fire shortly after the sun went down. If she told him she could teleport, he would have come close to believing it. I will travel separately, she said after a moment's thought. I dislike sitting on the cart. Her expression curdled at the thought of their mode of conveyance. Tyron smiled wryly. It has a certain rustic charm when you get used to it, he offered. I'm sure, she said, her expression letting her doubts be known. 
It's your choice, obviously, he said. I wouldn't dream of telling you how to travel. Wise. Tyron didn't know exactly what the vampire wanted from her time traveling with him. But he hoped it would be over soon. She was intelligent, articulate and gave good advice on occasion. Her company could be quite pleasant, so long as he could forget what she was. On the other hand, she was an undead monster that fed on blood, her flawless beauty. Nothing more than a tool to lure her prey. Being around her was unnerving at the best of times, and somewhat terrifying at the worst. He wouldn't be too sad if she gave up on her quest and turned back to her realm. You should perform the ritual before you leave, she advised. I will be interested to see what progress you have made. This would be the first time he'd performed a ritual in a week. Fingers crossed his hard work had paid off. Events? You have engaged with others and forged bonds with them. Race. Human has reached level 13. Your attempts at cooking have increased proficiency. Cooking has reached level 2. Dismembering remains has increased your proficiency. Butchery has reached level 4. Intense study and application has increased your proficiency. Corpse appraisal has reached level 7. Intense study and application has increased your proficiency. Corpse preparation has reached level 7. Your creation of new undead and your manipulation of the spell form has increased proficiency. Raised dead has reached level 8. Your use of the spell bone stitching has increased proficiency. Bone stitching has reached level 6. Your use and study of death magic has increased your proficiency. Death magic has reached level 6. You have raised minions and they have fought on your behalf. Necromancer has reached level 17. You have received plus 2 intelligence, plus 1 wisdom, plus 1 constitution and plus 1 manipulation. Your patrons continue to delight in the seeds of chaos that are strewn wherever you tread. Your call is awaited. Name. Tyron Steelum. Age. 18. Race. Human. Level 13. Class. Necromancer. Level 17. Subclasses. Anathema. Level 10. None. None. Locked. Racial feats. Level 5. Steady hand. Level 10. Night owl. Attributes. Strength. 12. Dexterity. 11. Constitution. 49. Intelligence. 69. Wisdom. 34. Willpower. 36. Charisma. 16. Manipulation. 26. Poise. 13. General skills. Arithmetic. Level 5 right parenthesis max. Handwriting. Level 5 right parenthesis max. Concentration. Level 5 right parenthesis max. Cooking. Level 2. Sling, level 3. Swordsmanship, level 1. Sneak, level 3. Butchery, level 4. Skill selections available. 2. Necromancer skills. Corpse appraisal, level 7. Corpse preparation, level 7. Death magic, level 6. Bone mending, level 3. General spells. Globe of light, level 5 right parenthesis max. Sleep, level 5 right parenthesis max. Magic Bolt, level 4. Necromancer Spells. Raise Dead, level 8. Bone Stitching, level 6. Commune with Spirits, level 3. Shivering Curse, level 3. Death Blades, level 3. Bone Armor, level 2. Minion Sight, level 2. Anathema Spells. Pierce the Veil, level 4. Appeal to the Court, level 2. Dark Communion, level 1. Suppress Mind, level 4. Repository, level 2. Fear, level 2. Necromancer Feats. Skeleton Focus 2. Magic Battery I. Anathema Feats. Repository. Wall of Thought I. Mysteries. Spell Shaping. Int plus 3 dot Wis plus 3. Words of Power. Wis plus 3 dot Char plus 3. As he poured over the numbers, Tyron felt a surge of triumph. His three key skills, the foundational building blocks of necromancy, were progressing nicely. After weeks of study, he was finally closing in on the coveted level 10. It felt too slow to him, given the pressure he was under. But he could appreciate that this pace was extremely quick. Some took a year or more to master their foundation before they advanced their class. He'd barely been at it for two months. Just in time, too. He'd reached level 17 after creating his latest minions, just three to go before he advanced his class. It was commonly held that most classes really only began to shine once they reached this point. Better feats, improved abilities, and more stats per level, all contributed to a rapid rise in power for those who managed to advance through this point. 
His father had warned him multiple times that it was also the point where most slayers died. Overconfident, he would shake his head and say, You get your hands on stronger abilities, but don't master them. What else could possibly happen? Some kin kicks your head in, and bam, another bronze rank bites the dust. It was all moot to Tyron. He had a few steps to go before it was relevant. Master the basic skills, only then would he push to level 20. To do that, he needed more remains. Corpse appraisal and preparation were level 7. Just 3 levels to go the hardest levels, but still just 3. He hadn't had much time to play with his other abilities, but there were a few gains he was happy to see. Cooking going up was unexpected, but welcome. He was doing all the food preparation for himself now, and the taste was less than stellar. Another level in his race was amazing. He was closing in on another racial feat. His current choices, Steady Hands and Night Owl, had proven to be inspired choices for a necromancer. No doubt there were other options that would be just as helpful. Ray's Dead was level 8, a fantastic result. Bone Stitching had reached level 6, along with Mending growing to 3. His ability to handle bones continued to grow, and the gains would show when he created his next group of skeletons. Other changes were minor. He'd been happy to max out the sleep spell, and his handwriting skill. All the scribbling he'd done in the back of the cart had paid off. These improvements wouldn't have a big impact on anything, but seeing the Unseen acknowledge he had reached the limit of what it would provide was pleasant at least. When he'd reached level 15, he'd chosen Magic Battery I, deciding to expand his personal magic reserves. Despite the gains he could make in creating more efficient minions, he decided that having extra magic to utilize his surprisingly healthy variety of spells in battle would be more useful. His new ability, Minion Sight, hadn't grown, which didn't shock him. He'd not practiced it at all after his initial experimentation. It was a simple spell that allowed him to perceive what a minion did. That was when he'd learned just how poor their vision was. Turns out those glowing purple orbs were pretty poor excuses for eyes. Just another thing he needed to work on to improve his creations. He told the others of his major gains, and they reacted positively. Looking good, Kid Dove remarked. You should reach your goal if you keep at it. Indeed you're said. Your speed of development has been remarkable. Tyron smiled, happy for the compliments and pleased with the results of his efforts. Still a long way to go he sighed, but I'll get there. He quickly destroyed the evidence of the ritual, throwing it into the embers of the fire, and watching it burn. He had to nudge it with his boot a few times, just to make sure no trace of the writing remained. What's the plan now, kid? Dove asked. I need resources to continue to study, and I think I'm ready to increase the number of minions I keep around. No shortage of dead bodies around, Dove remarked. Things are fucked down on the plains. True Tyrant sighed. We'll head down there and see if we can find a village or farming commune. If they're alive, I can help out, maybe snag some coin or supplies, if not more to work with. Shortly after, they hit the road. The cart bumped along the pulley maintained dirt trail, pulled by a team of skeletons, as Tyrant sat on the back, dove next to him as he poured over his notes. Things were going well. Hopefully he would get a little more time. Chapter 58 the countryside rolled past, slowly. Every now and again, Tyron would lift his head from his notes, or the chunk of bone he was working on, to glance at the ruined landscape and sigh. It wasn't a pretty sight. The hordes of Rivkin unleashed from the break, had likely been concentrated to the east. But that didn't mean none had come south to these plains. In the shadow of the Boundary Mountains, small villages dotted the landscape, farming communities spread out like a patchwork blanket. After the harvest, the bulk of the crops and livestock would travel to Foxbridge, and from there be taken down river to the larger cities on packed barges. Not this year. The small villages were easy pickings. The monsters had ravaged the landscape, ripping through the fields and anyone they'd found along the way. A devastating loss of life and land that would set the development of these lands back decades. And for what? I think that smoke Tyron muttered after another quick scan of the horizon. That's a little odd. Nothing should be burning at this point, Dove remarked. Survivors. Unlikely, but possible. Tough fuckers if they're still scraping a living out here. That was true. Without the support of the community and most of the animals slaughtered, there wasn't much to live off. There was, of course, another possibility. Gold Peace says it's bandit stuff, said. Tyron rolled his eyes. What are you going to do with gold, Dove? You can't eat, don't need clothes. 
can't have sex, or do anything really. Why do you want my damn gold? Firstly, that gold belonged to the Slayers of Woodsedge. Don't say my damn gold as if you have some legitimate claim to it. Secondly, that's hurtful. I don't need to be reminded of my dickless state. Thirdly, I'm bored and want to bet. You in or out? Out Tyron said as he reached behind to grasp his sword by the scabbard, dragging it forward and onto his lap. Smart. In remote communities like this, the law was often a suggestion more than a guarantee. The only time of year they reliably saw any official of the state was tax time. Now, even that thin veneer was lost. Preying on other survivors, looting farmsteads, doing whatever they could to hold on until civilization returned. Then, they would sweep everything under the rug and go back to life as it had been. I'll take the minions and go have a look. You going to leave me here? I don't want to miss the fun. There might not be any fun, Dove. Just a few farmers trying to eke out a living with trampled crops. And trying to bury their dead. Bury the dead. What a complete waste. Also, showing up with a glowing skull sort of screams, Necromancer, don't you think? Having ten skeletons trailing along behind you doesn't. I won't stroll in with them. Tyron had his minions stop moving with a mental command and climbed down from the cart. From a bundle tied up in coarse cloth, he extracted the small arsenal they'd amassed and passed it out. The skeletons grasped the arms he handed them in their cold, bony fingers. No sound except the occasional scrape of bone on bone emanating from the undead. The smoke they'd seen was still two kilometers away, too far for anyone to be able to see the true nature of the creatures he stood with. It was risky, but he'd need to leave them a distance away, if he wanted to conceal what he was. I'll be back soon, he told the skull sitting on the cart. Don't do anything crazy. The light in the skull's eyes flickered disapprovingly. Your attempts at humor, specifically aimed at my expense, are unwelcome. Thanks Dove. Go and get yourself killed. Fuck you too, Tyron smiled as he finished buckling his sword at his waist. A few copper coins in his patch, a little food and water in his pack. And he looked just like any other traveler, if a little better armed. Hopefully. They wouldn't test him with his blade, since Tyron remained quite inept with it. If he needed to defend himself, it would be his spells doing the heavy lifting. As he trudged along the path, the source of the smoke grew clearer in the distance. The source appeared to be a settlement, or what used to be one. Not quite a village. It was a cluster of farmhouses built together for protection, which hadn't done much, apparently. Not long ago, it probably housed five or six families. Now, who could tell? Four main houses, a couple of barns, a stable even. Looks like it was a successful community. Certainly the surrounding fields appeared as if they'd been neat and well maintained before the break. In Tyron's mind, you could judge a farmer by the state of the fences. In Foxbridge, Mayor Aaron's fences were always straight as an arrow and tight as a drum. The moment a post started to show signs of rot, it was ripped out and replaced even the older stone fences were upkept religiously. Contrast that with Farmer Connell, who constantly lost stock due to gaps in his crumbling boundary fence, and one could tell who was prosperous with a glance. Despite the obvious damage the kin had done on their way through, Tyron could tell these had been good fences. His gut soured. If these had been wealthy farmers, that didn't bode well for what he would find. A cold wind cut through him, and he drew his cloak a little tighter about himself as he continued to walk along the worn path toward the settlement. It was still midday, but the clouds overhead meant the light was more dim than would otherwise be expected. With a thought, he ordered his minions to draw closer. In these conditions, they shouldn't be spotted if he brought them forward a touch. His eyes scanned the buildings carefully, expecting an arrow to come flying at him any moment. The main houses had been built in a square pattern, protecting a small courtyard between them, and it was from there the smoke originated. A bonfire, perhaps. When he stood a hundred meters away, he stopped and waited, watching carefully. No movement greeted his eye, nor did anyone hail him. For a long moment, he considered turning and walking away. These people had nothing to do with him. He had no obligations towards them, and the setup looked worse and worse the longer he looked at it. If they didn't greet him outside, it probably meant they wanted to lure him closer, perhaps bring him within the compound before they approached him, and by that time, it would be too late for him to run. Of course, he may just be paranoid. Innocent folk trying to salvage what was left of their life. Perhaps they didn't have anyone watching this direction. Unlikely. 
tire inside. He would go in, he knew he would. He hoped it was because he wanted to help people. If they were struggling survivors, he could offer some assistance, put them in contact with other groups, maybe do a little trade before he went on his way. He could leave them a little better off than when he found them. It had happened a couple of times. If they were bandits, then he could rid the area of them and make life easier for others who were struggling under their thumb. It wasn't pretty, but it was necessary if people were going to make it through the next few months. It wasn't because he needed the bodies. He hoped it wasn't. Finished questioning his motives, he firmed his resolve and resumed his slow walk along the dirt path. Soon, the buildings loomed overhead, but still... There was nothing to be heard, nor any faces to be seen. The structures had obviously been hit during the break. Scratches in the stonework, wooden window coverings battered in or hanging from their hinges, were sure signs of struggle. The surrounding fences had taken a lot of damage. The kin weren't interested in buildings, but they would have homed in on the signs of life here in the compound. Bodies of fallen creatures from Nagrithin still littered the ground here and there. Arrows... It looked like though someone had come to retrieve them after the fact. Good sign. Someone survived the initial attack at least. Stepping cautiously, Tyron moved between two buildings. The gap between them only wide enough for a cart to fit through. He could hear the fire now, crackling away as it chewed through the still damp wood, the occasional pop and sizzle punctuating the sound of flames. He kept a hand on the hilt on his blade as he readied a spell, the magic coiling in him as it answered to his call. Greetings, friend, a cheerful voice sounded from behind. Holy shit. Tyron nearly jumped as he snapped around to see a humble-looking man smiling at him from a few meters away. Heart hammering in his chest, he tried to sum up this new figure as quickly as he could. Farm clothes, dirty hands, middle-aged perhaps. One of the owners here, or a farm hand. You near scared me to death, Tyron said as he pretended to relax his posture, a forced smile on his face. You creep up on every visitor like this. As best I can. Yes. The man held both hands up to show he was unarmed, but made no move to approach. Pays to be careful these days. Since the monsters came through, people are resorting to desperate measures in order to eat. You know how it is. This time, Tyron was careful to keep an eye behind him, standing side onto his welcomer. Of course, he said smoothly, it's most unfortunate. He gestured to the bonfire behind him. I saw your fire and wondered if I could help. People need to look out for each other if we're going to make it through. Is there anything you need doing? Any messages I can carry for you? The man smiled wryly. Well, I can think of a few things you can do, he said. Why don't we step inside and get warm around the fire so we can discuss it? The expression on the young necromancer's face grew tight. Sure thing. He said, then swept his hand before him, after you. The farmer's hands lowered to rest on his hips. He shook his head. You first traveler, his voice hardened, I insist. Minions, come. It would take time for the skellies to reach him. He had to delay. Tyron considered attacking the person in front of him, but decided against it. There was no chance he wasn't being watched by others. If he tried to flee... He'd catch an arrow in the back from an upstairs window. Moving slowly, Tyron removed his hand from the hilt of his sword. I don't need any trouble, he said. You can just let me walk away. Maybe I don't want to. The man grunted as others now revealed themselves. Two dirty looking men with grim faces stepped around the corner and approached Tyron from behind. He tensed spells at the ready, but didn't let them fly just yet. The two newcomers grabbed him roughly by the arms, one of them reaching around to unbuckle his belt, and throw the scabbard to the ground. What do you want us to do with him, Davin? One said. Tyron leaned back. By the five, this guy had shocking breath. Take him in. Monty will want to see him before anything gets done. We can just off him now, the other beside Tyron spoke slyly. Hide the body and keep the coin between us. The man called Davin shook his head, a frown creasing his brow. And if Monty found out, you'd be strung up and left for the crows. You think it's worth it for a few copper. Don't be an idiot. I'd rather not be off Tyron said, if it's all the same to you. Shut up. A cuff across the jaw was his reward for opening his mouth, and Tyron cursed himself. Dove was rubbing off on him more than he thought. Don't talk smart with the bandits, idiot, he reprimanded himself. The two dragged him inside, Davin bringing up the rear. Not wanting to be beaten unnecessarily, Tyron played along, cooperating on the surface, but keeping his magic steady. The chances these backcountry folk had ever seen a mage were slim, 
at least one that didn't work in irrigation. If any of them could sense the arcane energy he held, ready to release in an instant, he'd be stunned. They held his shoulders and arms on both sides. But there was plenty he could do without the use of his hands. A magic bolt might not be enough to kill, but he could hardly miss at this range and it would surely knock them down. Failing that, he could use fear. Suppress mind was another option, but he didn't want to be caught in a battle of wills, when there was more than one opponent. With sleep at level 5, there was a chance he could force it onto them even if they tried to resist. All he had to do was delay. Once the minions arrived, he could turn the tables. They stepped into the courtyard, and Tyron felt his chest grow cold and his throat constrict. It appeared as though the original inhabitants might have survived the Rifkin in decent shape. The compound was quite defensible, after all. With archers above and barricades between the buildings, they could fight off the monsters quite well. Since none of the bigger, more dangerous ones had come south, it was more than feasible. Sadly, that appeared to have been where their luck ran out. The men had been staked. They were still there, dead bodies soaked in blood, suspended from the sharpened wood that burst from their chests. It looked as if they'd made some sort of sport, or ritual of it. Eight stakes, each adorned with its own corpse, surrounded the bonfire in the center of the courtyard. The pools of blood that had dripped from their hanging feet, had curdled and dried in place. They'd been there a week at least, Tyron judged as he studied the scene. I don't see the women or children, he said quietly. Well you wouldn't, would you? Laughed the man on his right. So they're still alive. Shut up. Another fist knocked his head sideways as they pulled him around the gripping spectacle. There were a few other men around, lounging near the bonfire. They watched him being dragged in with interest, muttering to each other, and laughing raucously at their crude jokes. Tyron counted them carefully. Six, seven, eight. Definitely more upstairs in the buildings. It was going to be tight. Hurry up, you damn piles of bones. The skeletons couldn't run. The best they could manage was a decently swift walk close enough to a march. Judging by the drain on his magic, exaggerated by the distance between them, they were moving as quickly as they could. It would be a little longer. Tie him to a post, Davin said, now clearly bored. We'll search him and leave him till Monty gets back. Tyron flicked a glance over his shoulder to see the man who now held his sword. The blade extended from the scabbard as he inspected the edge. Hey, my father gave me that sword, he cursed. And now you've donated it to me. Cheers for that. Without ceremony, he allowed himself to be dragged towards a nearby fence. Where he was kicked down to his knees, his hands pulled behind his back, and hurriedly tied to the post. With that done, the men rifled through his pockets, stripping off his cloak and relieving him of his possessions. He's got bugger all, mate, they reported to Davin. Leave him, then. A cry of alarm rang out from above. Big group coming. Something's wrong with him. Came a call from the second floor. The three around him turned to see the cause of the disturbance. Tyron smiled. Chapter 59. With his captors distracted, Tyron knew it was time to make a move. If they decided to remove a potential complication, namely him, before dealing with the new threat, then it likely wouldn't go well for him. That meant he needed to deal with the rope. He had a method in mind, though it wasn't his favorite. Magic Bolt was a simple and versatile spell. A ball of arcane energy, shaped and directed to fly and discharge its force into whatever it hit. It was common for a mage to point or face their hand palm out in the direction they wanted to fire it. But that wasn't necessary. The point of origin could be anywhere around the person casting it, within a few centimeters of the body. Despite the growing din around him, he closed his eyes and concentrated, forming the spell directly above the rope that bound his wrists together. Not being able to see the target added another layer of difficulty, and it required all his focus to ensure the magic took the shape he desired. Once it was ready, he let it fly. Immediately he felt a sting along his wrists as the bolt blasted downward, ripping through the fibers of the rope and taking several layers of skin along with it before it hit the ground behind him. Before the rope could fall, he snatched it in his fingers, trying not to let the pain show on his face. What was that? Davin spun around. Tyron didn't look up, his head hung low as he allowed his arms to bear his weight. He wanted to look defeated, and apparently, he pulled it off. Marcus, watch this idiot for me. I'm going to see what the fuss is, Davin spat before he turned and jogged toward the building the call came from. Or, oh, but Marcus spluttered as his two companions left him before he kicked the dirt in frustration. Then he had a better idea and kicked Tyron in the gut. 
H-R-K, he grunted as the farmhand's shoe sank into him. The divines bless high constitution. You all tied up. When I gotta watch this shit, he whined clearly wanting to sate his curiosity and find out what the disturbance was. That's ten bony boys marching up the road to split your head in, moron. Without long to consider, Tyron tried to decide what to do. He could cast fear, but his good friend Marcus might just scream and wail, attracting attention, which was the opposite of what he wanted to achieve. He could use suppressed mind, but he no longer had a weapon. If he crushed the other's will and reduced him to a slack-jawed, drooling simpleton or more of one, then how was he supposed to kill him? The other choice would be to pummel him with bolts. He flexed his fingers as he considered what to do and felt the remains of the rope still held in his grip. That was also an option he grimaced. Holy mother, Tyron gasped. Do you see that? He stared over the other man's shoulder with eyes wide. And, by some miracle, Marcus turned around. What? The man muttered. Scarcely believing his luck, the necromancer quickly intoned the words of power his hands rising from behind his back to flick out a few quick sigils. Before his captor could sound a warning, the spell was ready. Marcus's eyes went wide as he saw his prisoner was no longer bound, but then something slammed into his mind, and he knew no more. He couldn't afford to be kind or gentle, not with people such as these, so Tyron brought the full weight of his mind to bear. Despite being low level, he had more than enough mental might to crush the will of a simple farmhand turned bandit. In moments, Marcus was reduced to a sightless lump, his eyes glazed and expression slack, as Tyron held his mind in an iron grip. He moved to capitalize on his advantage. He'd learned to move while maintaining the spell, but not quickly, sudden movements would break his concentration. He had to be careful. He shifted the rope in his hands until he found a section long enough to use then looped it over the man's head and around his neck before he pulled, dragging the limp form of his victim to the ground, before he shuffled backwards and out of sight. It was a difficult thing, holding a mind at bay as he strangled the body. Rather than thrash and fight physically, Marcus fought back with his will, forcing Tyron to clamp down ever harder, as his grip held firm on the rope. He tried not to watch as the face in front of him turned blue, but concentrated inwardly, dominating the mind as it shrieked and flailed before it grew weak, the resistance fading, until the consciousness winked out like a snuff candle. The rope slipped out of his shaking hands, the fingers curling inwards to fists, as the young necromancer mastered himself. He couldn't afford to be distracted, he was vulnerable until he could reunite with his minions. They were close now, he could feel it, and getting closer by the second. I'm exposed, need to lay low for a bit. The others hadn't come to investigate this side of the courtyard, They'd gone to blockade the opening between buildings on the path Tyron had come in, or headed up to the buildings on that side of the compound. Even so, he didn't want to take any chances. If someone glanced back and saw him huddling here, he'd have an arrow in his face. He slipped around the fence and found a shuttered window that hadn't been barred. He pulled it open quickly and jumped inside, scanning the darkness within. Nobody inside. That was good. With a moment to himself, he crouched and cast another spell. Minion sight. Following the link he had with all of his undead, he allowed himself to see what they saw, though only one at a time. He picked the closest, and his view was overtaken by the hazy, purple-hued view of the skeleton. They were approaching the farmhouses now, perhaps only a hundred meters away. The skeletons and the lead had their shields up, defending against arrows being shot from the roof and upper floor. The undead did not know fear, and continued to advance in the face of the archers. But the humans were not so resilient. Even through the blurred eyes of the dead, he could see the wavering spirits of the bandits. There was fear. He could use that. He was on the opposite side of the courtyard from where his minions were approaching. If he wanted to help them, he'd need to get closer. Tyron quickly stood and began to make his way through the dark and seemingly abandoned house, wishing he had a weapon. He'd rather not use magic unless he had to, and if he could avoid strangulation he'd preferred. The noise continued to increase as the men called back and forth amongst each other, bellows of anger, cries of fear. The skeletons would arrive soon, and Tyron knew from experience that staring into the black sockets of the dead was an unnerving experience one that might break more than one defender. When he approached the end of the building, Tyron unbarred the door and swung it inwards only to find a bandit standing in the gap between buildings. The two started in surprise, the muddy bandit recovering first, 
and swiping wildly with his rusted blade. Tyron staggered back as pain flared in his left hand cursing under his breath. A moment later, a magic bolt fizzed forward and slammed into the chest of his attacker, a wet crunch noting the impact. Filled with desperate energy, Tyron rushed forward and slammed his forearm into the throat of the attacker. Unable to call for help, the bandit could do little but wheeze as the necromancer grabbed him by the hair and pulled him back through the door. A minute later Tyron emerged, a hastily cut bandage tied around his palm, and his face creased with frustration. The skeletons had arrived and were engaged in a brawl with the bandits. The defenders had hastily blocked off the entrance between the two buildings on the north side, where the undead had attacked. Tyron could have all or some of them moved to circle around. There were four entrances to the courtyard after all, but he'd rather leave them in place to take the focus while he snuck around. If only that idiot hadn't been watching on this side. The hand shouldn't be a problem, if he was careful. The cut wasn't too deep, he'd be able to form sigils with it well enough. He snuck inside the courtyard and found another window he could slip through, climbing in gracelessly with his wounded hand. Once inside, he rushed to find the stairs. He needed to reach the second floor as fast as he could. The longer the fight went on, the more damage his skeletons would take from the arches above. There was so much shouting, cursing and clashing of steel that it wouldn't matter how much noise he made as he stomped up the old wooden staircase. He burst up the final stretch to find a corridor in front of him that ended in a window, a shivering bandit leaning out to fire directly down on the minions below. Without thinking for long, he brought up his hands and formed a magic bolt. The spell whizzed almost invisibly through the air, before it cracked into the unguarded back of his target, the force sending the archer tumbling through the gap, shrieking into the melee below. Tyron didn't hesitate, he ran toward the window, his hands already moving as the words of power rolled from his lips. Before anyone could interrupt his cast, he progressed rapidly through the spellwork, forming sigils and constructing the magic with reckless speed. His hand flared with pain and almost threw him off, but he grit his teeth and forced the digits to align as they should before things could go awry. Even so, cold sweat broke out on his forehead as he finished the spell. Death Blades arcane energy that reeked of death, began to coat the weapons of the skeletons, billowing around the blades like a cloud of black smoke. Panicked cries began to ring out amongst the bandits at this new development, but Tyron wasn't done, can't have you running away. He stepped back from the window and checked his surroundings. In the chaos, it was impossible to tell exactly what was going on, but he didn't think there were any other bandits on this floor. It was likely they'd gone to the roof once they realized they couldn't shoot at the skeletons from the outward-facing windows anymore. Since that was the case, he decided to gamble that he had enough time to cast one more spell. Wary of his near-disastrous slip last time, he took a little more time with his next spell. When the last sigil slipped into place and he completed it, a sigh of relief almost slipped from his lips. He stepped to the window so he could see his target, and released the spell with a grim satisfaction. Shivering curse. He targeted the men fending off his skeletons on the ground, and saw the spell take effect. Before he leaned back from the opening, lest he be seen. On the ground, the bandits felt as if the air itself had dramatically cooled around them before it drove into their limbs, hardening the blood in their veins. Their movements were stiff, joints became locked and their breath froze in their lungs. Faced with the silent, implacable advance of the dead in front of them, it was the last straw for more than one. With a despairing wail, first one, then another at the rear of the fighting, turned and began to run. The men left in the thick of it cried out in rage and fear. But it was too late for them. Some of them wanted to flee as well, but were too slow, cut down by the merciless bone warriors before them. In a matter of moments, the skeletons had gained access to the courtyard, slicing down the last remaining defenders. All that remained were the bandits on the roof, and by the sounds of things, they were in the process of running for their lives, one even throwing himself from the building. Tyron did as all proud necromancers should. He found an empty room and hid in a corner, as he mentally directed the skeletons through the remaining buildings and onto the roofs. Only when he was totally satisfied that no bandits remained did he emerge and inspect the damage. He'd lost two minions in the fight, their skulls cracked open and the light in their eyes extinguished. It was a loss, but not one he couldn't absorb. In return, he had six fresh bandits to work with, the rest having fled. There was a distinct possibility that they would regroup and return. It sounded like some of them had already left along with the leader Monty. With any luck, they wouldn't return today. 
and by tomorrow he could have more than made up for his losses. Still, the entire thing left a sour taste in the young man's mouth. In future, he may well forego any attempt at concealing his nature, and just advance on them with his minions in tow. It wasn't worth the risk, and things were getting more lawless. Not less as time passed in the plains. Blood and bone, he cursed. With no obvious foes left nearby, he sent four skeletons to fetch the cart, and brought the remaining four with him to tour the buildings. Several doors were locked, especially upstairs, and it took him a while to locate any keys. Davin had them, as it turned out, the first person he'd met here was now lying dead in the dirt, an ugly wound in his back, and clean out his chest where he'd been run through. Tyron bent down and retrieved the sword with a certain grim satisfaction. When he got the doors open and saw what was inside, Tyron no longer felt guilty. He found the women and children. Chapter 60 Tyron leaned back from the table with a sigh. He moved to wipe the sweat from his brow, but hesitated when he caught sight of his hands. He looked around for the bucket of water he'd drawn, then grimaced when he noticed the decidedly red color of it. Were there chunks floating in it as well? Once upon a time, such a sight would have sent the necromancer running for a nearby bush. Now it merely caused his stomach to gurgle in protest. Progress. And yet, I can't find it in me to be happy about it, he muttered to himself. Holding his two bloodstained hands up in front of himself, he pushed the door open with his hip and glanced around the courtyard. It looked far better than it had two days ago. The first major improvement was the lack of dead bodies on stakes. He'd taken them down and decided he would put the remains to work instead of burying them. The farmers hadn't deserved the death they'd gotten, but they didn't need those bones any longer. The worst damage of the fight had been repaired, the fallen bandits had more than earned their place on the chopping block. He had little choice but to grip the handle of the hand pump with one hand to get the water flowing, and from there he was able to scrub himself clean. Grime and thick blood clung to his skin, and he had to be vigorous to remove it all. Red water flowed around his feet as he washed, spread across the packed dirt in oily trails. Ah, sorry to bother you, a soft voice spoke behind him. Tyron whirled to see a whisper-thin brown-haired woman clutching a bucket behind him. I needed water for the kitchen, she murmured. Tyron cursed himself. He was too distracted and didn't notice her walking up to him. Ah, no problem, he said. I'll just get out of your way. He awkwardly stepped to the side and shook his hands dry, trying not to look at the spreading blood water. I hope to heck that wasn't her husband. Once the thought struck him, he had to be somewhere else. So he stammered out an apology and beat a hasty retreat. Once he was back inside, he quickly shut the door behind him and took a moment to collect himself. I fucking hope that wasn't her husband, Dove remarked. Gods, I know Tyron groaned. You could have just buried them. Little cold carving their family members while they're right across the courtyard. It was your idea, you bony bastard. You didn't have to agree. That's true. I just need the bones. And he did. His tests had to continue. The only way for him to improve his skills was to practice and attempt new methods. In order to do that, he needed a steady supply of remains. I saved their lives, he said, so I'm entitled to. He couldn't bring himself to say it. But that didn't stop Dove from finishing it for him. Their husband's corpses. Fucking hell's tyrant. That is cold. My spiritual nips are shriveling over here. Oh, shut it, he said. He resolutely ignored the skull as he set about tidying up. With a few mental commands, he had the skeletons on hand, gather up the various buckets and tubs he filled to take outside, and dump in the midden he'd had them dig. With that done, he tried to put his embarrassment behind him as he gathered up the bones and took them to the second floor. Once he'd gotten them upstairs, he moved from room to room, adding bones to his various tests and experiments. Having an entire second floor to work with was truly a luxury that he hadn't experienced before. It was certainly superior to crouching over piles of bones on the floor of a cave. It was a shame he wouldn't be able to stay long, but for now he'd take advantage of the facilities. Once he'd disperse his latest hole, he made another pass through the rooms, checking the progress of his various tests. With more time on his hands, he'd been able to carefully assess each of the bones, one by one, searching for any damage or cracking and repairing it, sealing any magic leaks, ensuring they were clean and dry, everything he could think of to ensure they were in the best possible condition. 
With time and practice, his ability to use magical senses to detect weaknesses in the bones was becoming more clear. It might not make much of a difference to the end performance of the minion, perhaps as little as a few percent, but that mattered to Tyron. To be as efficient as possible, he needed the best possible undead. If they were going to draw on his energy to fight, then they better be using it well. Also, he felt he was being disrespectful to the dead. If he didn't try as hard as he could to create the perfect minions from their remains. If he was going to desecrate their bones, he may as well do a damn good job of it. He pushed the awkwardness behind him as he stepped from room to room, using his mind to peek at the minute, shifting energies contained in the various groupings of bones. He was on the verge of a breakthrough, thanks to Dove, but everything had to be confirmed and measured before he was prepared to celebrate. After he'd checked on everything twice, he walked downstairs and sat heavily in the wooden chair in the kitchen. When was the last time you slept, kid? Tyron thought about it. I haven't slept since the attack he admitted. I know. I'll rest soon. The skull was silent for a moment. You want to talk about it? No. You killed a fair few people in that attack. It's going to rattle anyone. I said I don't want to talk about it, Dove. Yeah. And what are you going to fucking do about it? Kill me. You locked me in this prison because you wanted a mentor, so swallow your piss-weak pride. Suck your balls up into your sternum and accept my wisdom. If not, that's fine, release me already. The necromancer grit his teeth for a moment, pulled in a deep breath before he released it all at once. He didn't want to have this conversation, but he also didn't want to lose the summoner's advice. Without Dove, it'd be just him and Jaw, and that thought was more frightening than he'd like to admit. Alright, lay it on me, Dove. What have you got to say? The purple eyes of the skull flared with baleful light. What's that tone? Am I your fucking dad? Are you in a rebellious phase or something? Tyron, you're on the run from the authorities. Making life and death decisions in a race against time to grow your power. You do not have time to sulk about killing a bunch of shithead bandits. I'm not sulking. My ethereal balls you aren't. You've been working yourself, pardon the pun, to the bone over the last two days. Dove, I always do that. I did that before I'd even awakened. And what were you running away from then? Silence. That's what I thought. Look, I'm not saying that you shouldn't push yourself. Obviously you need to go as hard as you can. But you need to work on your fucking mind. If you're running away from your stress, it'll affect your work build up over time. And you'll blow up at exactly the wrong moment. You're going to kill people before this journey is done. Probably a fucking ton of them. The sooner you come to grips with that, the better off you're going to be. I didn't want to kill anyone, Dove Tyron snapped. I wanted to hunt Rivkin to level up. I wanted to protect people. I wanted to prove that I can use this class as a force for good. Isn't that exactly what you've been doing? Good people tend to limit the number of people they put on a stake to roughly zero. I really don't think you murdered any saints the other day. Don't say murdered Tyron flinched. Offed. Killed. Slaughtered. Laid to rest. Pushed off the mortal coil. Sent to the embrace of the five. Torso fucked with a sword. I've got more. You know what? Murdered is better than some of those. At least you didn't try and say it was the minions rather than you doing the killing. That'd be completely gutless. The minions are literally in my head. We can't exactly be considered separate. Cowards will try anything Dove said matter-of-factly. I know you'd rather not face up to this reality, kid, but you're going to have to. And soon, unless I miss my guess, the survivors will either come back in greater numbers, or they'll run east until they find the law, and come back hunting with the marshals. In truth, the necromancer had hoped they would come back that same night. With little time to plan, or recover from the shock, they would have been easy pickings. Two days with no sighting of the bandits, or their apparent leader, was worrying. How long until we have to move on? He asked. Two more days at the most. This is a good place to work in, but too many people have seen you and the boneheads. When the slayers eventually sweep through, they'll know you are here. You need as large a head start as you can get by that point. Unless Tyron said slowly, I can find and eliminate all of the bandits. No one can talk if no one is alive. You were feeling miserable about killing people a minute ago. Now you want to mass murder. That's fucking character growth right there, kid. I'm impressed. I'm trying to stay alive here, Dove Tyron scowled. That's different from the other day. I could have walked away. You probably should have, but here we are. Look, even if you kill all those pricks, 
You really want to put the women and kids in a position of having to lie to the marshals. That's a crime, in case you forgot. I think their lives are going to be hard enough, don't you? Tyron slumped in his chair. It was true. When he'd found the survivors of the farming community locked in those rooms, the things they'd gone through had been written all over their faces. He didn't think he would ever forget their glassy stares. Even the kids. With their husbands dead and the farmhands having rebelled, it would be almost impossible for them to work the land, or even hold on to it. It had taken these families generations to build what they'd had, and now it was lost. He couldn't ask anything of them. You're talking a lot of sense, he admitted sadly. I'll make plans to head out tomorrow. If you can, talk it over with your tonight. She'll agree with me. I will. The two sat in silence for a few minutes as Tyron focused inward and tried to settle his roiling emotions. He felt a little better after his talk with Dove. He didn't think he would ever become comfortable with the thought of killing people. He certainly hoped not, but he also couldn't deny the bandits had deserved what they'd gotten. He just wished someone else had done it. Enough of that depressing shit the skull finally said. How are the bones doing? Was I right? With a chance to talk about something else, especially his craft, Tyron's eyes lit up as he sat forward with excitement sparking in his eyes. I think so he enthused. Another day to tell for sure. But yeah, I think you got it. Huh. Simplicity itself. Don't underestimate a summoner. Kid, we are a cut above. It's easier for me to see because I'm looking down from a higher angle. That's all it is. The skull's boasting wasn't anything new. But Tyron had to admit he probably should have thought of it himself. The key question they had considered was how wild undead were created. Someone died in the wild, somewhere with strong magic, and the process started. That much was obvious. They didn't know exactly how it began, but the magic would begin to change into death-attuned energy. Just a tiny moat to start with. Then that speck would start to jump from bone to bone, growing and multiplying over time, until the skeleton became fully saturated. At that point, the threading would occur naturally. A simple mind, possibly a remnant spirit, would be infused with the skeleton and bam, wild skeleton. Due to their testing, they also knew you couldn't start the process unless you had a full skeleton. Tyron couldn't put a bag full of femurs in a room and then come back to find them bouncing about on the floor. Which was a good thing. Otherwise, how could he store them safely? But then Dove had a thought. What if they started the process? but then remove part of the skeleton? Would it continue until the bones were saturated and create a half skeleton? Or would they only half fill with energy? Could they take 10 skeletons, lay them together to start the process, then take all the leg bones and stick them in a room, all the arms in a different room, the skulls in another, and would the saturation continue afterwards? Turns out, yes it would. 20 tibia together in one room were happily bouncing death magic between each other. 20 shins in another were doing the same. It would take another day for them to fully saturate, even with Tyron helping to speed things along. But he couldn't wait to see what happened. Would the skeletons try to pull themselves together from different rooms to form a wild undead? Or would they just stay in place? If he brought them back together, would the bone threading begin to form naturally? He hoped not. The best outcome would be if the bones didn't knit together on their own, at least for long enough for him to complete the process himself, and then raise the minion as his own. He'd be creating a fresh undead with fully empowered remains, soaked in death energy, and with all the benefits of his abilities. Better threading meant better movement and greater efficiency. His mastery over raised dead meant less wasteful conduits with his minions. Perhaps even more importantly, if he didn't have to empower the bones with his own magic, he could shorten the ritual, and cast it using less of his own energy. It would shorten the time needed significantly. Or, better yet, he could use that time to make improvements on other parts of the spell. The magic conduit was always a focus, but the mind construct placed in the skull was another place he could make dramatic gains. Unfortunately, he had no idea how to get started on that. Mind magic wasn't something he'd ever looked at. But get started he would. He was confident he could puzzle it out, given enough time and a few clues. If these methods proved effective in creating better undead, he was confident that refining them was all he would need to push his skills to 10. To say he was excited about it was an understatement. Just don't perform the ritual until you're confident you've reached the point you need to reach Dove advised. Once you hit 20, that's it, you're cooked. Time to upgrade the class if you're ready or not. I know that Tyron scowled. 
Who in the entire empire doesn't know that? Just a little friendly reminder, kid. No need to get your balls in a twist. I've seen a lot of slayers muck up and go too early. After you offed all those guys the other day, you just can't take the chance. They might have only put you up one level. They might have given you all three. Better not to chance it. I won't. The light in the sockets of the skull gleamed. Good. All you have to worry about then is if those idiots come back and try to kill you. Tyron sighed heavily as he pinched the bridge of his nose. He really was tired. I thought they'd have come back already, to tell the truth. Might be taking them a while to work up the guts. Or perhaps they got scattered and haven't been able to get all their people back together. The two sat and thought for a while, before the necromancer looked around suddenly. What time is it? He asked. How the fuck would I know? You know what I mean, Dove. How long until you're is back? Couple of hours. I think. Why? What's gotten up your ass? Not your. I didn't think she'd be into that. Then again she has a very dominant personality. Shut. Ah. Dove Tyron grated. It's not that so much as I'm worried she'll eat the survivors over there. I don't want to rescue these people only to have them sucked dry by someone ostensibly on my side. I wish she'd suck me dry. Of what? Ectoplasm. That's not a thing. Look. Obviously you're stressed. If you're that worried about getting attacked, why don't you put your fucking skills to use and learn a little more about who these guys were and what they were planning to do? How am I supposed to do that? Are you fucking kidding me? Are you a necromancer? Or what? Go necromance. You can speak to the dead, can't you? Aren't you doing it right this second? Oh, right. Chapter 61. It was somewhat embarrassing to have forgotten he had this ability. Tyron had been so focused on perfecting his ability to assess, prepare and raise skeletons, that his other abilities had dropped almost totally from his awareness. Specifically, his ability to speak to the dead. The spell was certainly an interesting one, and something he'd love to study in further detail. But as it didn't directly lead to the creation of superior minions, and therefore wouldn't help him to level, he'd left it for more important things. As night began to fall over the farmstead, Tyron hesitantly wandered over to the house being used by the survivors. When he made it to the door, he took a deep breath, then knocked a few times before stepping back. He couldn't hear much on the other side. It was almost unnaturally quiet over here most of the time. Doubly so when you considered the dozen or so children inside. When it wasn't quiet, it was usually because someone was either screaming or crying, or both. Tyron preferred it quiet. After a few moments, the door swung open, and he saw Annette, the lady who had met him by the hand pump earlier. He breathed a quick sigh of relief, though he tried to hide it. Of all the wives who had been saved, she was the most capable, though she was still quite injured, and seemed incapable of looking him in the eye. Why yes, is there something we can do for you? She asked timidly. Bit of a silly question really. What could they possibly do for him? No, no, of course not. In fact, is there anything I can do for you? Do you need anything else? I'm happy to go looking if there's a shortage. The young widow held up her hands. Oh, ah, uh, we're fine for the moment, thank you. The two fell silent for a moment as Tyron struggled to deal with the awkward situation. He felt terrible for what these people had gone through, but anything he said or did just felt so hopelessly small compared to their needs. I, uh, just wanted to say I was going to use the courtyard for a ritual. I would appreciate it if someone kept an eye on the little ones and made sure they didn't come out. It may be a little disturbing for any of you to see it. Annette's eyes widened in fear for a moment before she looked down and nodded repeatedly. Yes, that will be fine. We will be careful. Thank you. So saying, she stepped back and closed the door softly. Job done, Tyron turned around and let out an explosive breath. Every interaction he had with the survivors was painful in the extreme. He'd saved them from a terrible fate. That was true. But it was hard for them to be grateful in the moment. They'd lost their families, their futures, their life's work. Some of them had lost children. They were shattered people who could barely, just barely, take care of each other. Any time he was around them he felt he had to step carefully. Otherwise they may just break, fall to pieces like dropped porcelain. He'd done whatever he could in terms of supplies and aid. But that was the extent of his capabilities. If his mother and father were here, it would be a different story. 
They would comfort them, make them food, give them a shoulder to cry on, a sympathetic ear. They'd stay for a week or more and slowly bring them out of their shells, slowly help them pick up the pieces of their lives. He just wasn't built that way. Dealing with people was hard. Thankfully, he could now focus on something much simpler, namely dealing with the dead. He stepped around the courtyard, remembering exactly how it had been laid out after the battle. He'd rather not have used the courtyard at all. But the closer he was to the side of the death, the better he would be able to use the magic. He decided he'd quite enjoy a chat with his old friend Davin. After making brief preparations, he began to incant the ritual. Commune with spirits was a curious piece of spell work. Truth be told, Tyron didn't understand half of it. Even now, he didn't know if what he conjured forth was an actual ghost, the soul of the recently departed, or simply a psychic imprint left of the ambient magic. There was a real chance that the dove he spoke to every day was not, in fact, his actual departed friend. He might be, but Tyron just didn't know. It was something he'd rather not think about. The words rolled from his tongue, each syllable giving shape and purpose to the magic he drew from within himself, assembling the ritual piece by piece. When it was done, he brought his hands together with a sharp clap, cutting off the flow of words. This was the first time he'd used the spell for its intended purpose. And he was a little nervous as he waited for something to happen. A mist appeared over the ground where Davin had died. The air grew colder and flowed inward, rapidly building the mist into a swirling column. Tyron studied it. The mist was cloud-like, thick, and it flowed and twisted two unseen currents. But never extending far outside the column. Two lights began to glow within, cold and blue. Those eyes did not belong to any living creature. Tyron recognized the look of the dead. Speak. It wasn't with words that the shade spoke, or even with its mind as the abyss did. It was the hiss of a blade sliding deep into a soul. It was the whisper of winter pulling the heat from a dying man. Tyron had no language to describe how he knew what had been said. But he did. Is that you, Davin? He asked. You have pulled me here. Speak. The spirit didn't seem particularly chatty. You seem to be in a rush, Davin. Got somewhere to be. Normally Tyron wouldn't mock the dead. But in the case of Davin and his band of merry thugs, he could break with his normal habits. These people deserved no respect, not even in death. The mist roared faster as the shade grew agitated, the eyes narrowing to slits. You killed me. Sure did. I will kill you. The fog boiled forward, the eyes and something else suspended within leaping forward to strike him. Except it couldn't. A golden shield sprang into being around the necromancer, fending off the mist that shrank back from it instinctively. I don't think that's going to work, Davin. You're stuck here until I release you, Tyron stated with a wry grin. There was something unhealthy about taunting your enemies from beyond the grave. Tyron felt he was enjoying it more than he should. He tried to get back on track. Give me the answers I want, and you can return back to your grave. Speak. The mist calmed once more, the current easing until it once more drifted lazily around itself. The eyes remained cold and baleful. But Tyron felt there was not much he could do about that. Your little gang here. How many of you were there? The shade roiled for a moment before it replied. 25. That was more than he'd expected. There hadn't been that many when he'd arrived. He frowned. How many did Monty take with him when he left? He was the leader of the group, wasn't he? Half. His idea to rebel. Convince the others. Not what Tyron wanted to hear. He'd only killed six bandits before they'd fled the scene, spooked by his undead. That meant there may well be 19 still out there. Nearly done with you, Davin. I want you to tell me why Monty left. Where did he go? When do you think he will be back? Those cold eyes burned with a savage light as the shade replied. Went to recruit. Faringer Farmstead. Two day trip. More hands. More girls. Back soon. The necromancer's face twisted. These scum weren't happy with the little slice of paradise they'd carved out for themselves. Was this Monty trying to set himself up as a bandit lord? The glee he saw in the shade sickened him. Were these people even human anymore? You think they can kill me, Davin? When this idiot gets back, you really think it matters how many people like you he brings? You'll die. Vengeance. After I kill them, I'll raise their bones as new servants. Then I'll talk to you again. Just so you can sleep forever knowing that I survived. Tyron forced a sick grin. In fact, 
I might go grab your bones right now. I carved the meat from your corpse, you know. Now I might just raise you so perhaps you might contribute something useful for once in your miserable existence. The shade roiled, the mist twisting this way, and that at a furious pace. It went to rush toward him once more, but Tyron ended the ritual with a contemptuous wave. At once the column of fog began to dissipate, falling as if it were being sucked slowly into the ground. The eyes faded as they too were pulled down, a long hiss of anger and despair echoing out, as the shade was sent back to wherever it had originated. When it was done, no sign remained of the magic he had performed. Tyron stood alone over the dirt and gravel that marked the place Davin had died. Well, he sighed to himself. That was creepy. If you find conversing with a mere shade to be more than you can handle, I am most concerned for your future. Tyron jumped as he heard the soft voice breathe into his ear. He spun to see your standing uncomfortably close, her perfect features set in an alluring smile. She'd managed to find herself a dress at some point. Humble and plain, it had likely belonged to one of the farm wives, but somehow she made it seem like a ball gown. The dignity and grace of her bearing was such that it likely didn't matter what she wore, she would look like nobility all the same. The necromancer blushed and stepped back to create a little space, his heart rate accelerating. Oh, ah, uh, hi y'all. I didn't realize that our sun had gone down. She watched his reaction with mild amusement. For a moment, he feared she would step forward and draw close again, but thankfully she remained in place. Indeed she drawled, you were most focused on your discussion with that thing. She sniffed. Ghosts and shades. Such ungrateful and undignified creatures. Only when bound to serve can they be relied upon. Are you saying he might have lied to me? That is indeed possible you're smiled. But that is not quite what I'm saying. What I want to communicate is that nothing can be relied upon that is not bound to your service by chains stronger than steel. So I can't trust you. The vampire laughed a throaty, musical sound that set his blood racing. Of course not, sweetling. Never trust a vampire. That is simply common sense. A timely reminder. He wasn't good at dealing with your. She was enchanting to look at. Her every gesture, every word, was designed to draw him in. Which was entirely the point. She wasn't a woman, she was a poison chalice. Every aspect was designed to be a lure. But if you tried to drink, you would die. Or in Tyron's case, likely be turned into a creature like her, more likely than not bound to her service by means he didn't understand. Somehow, even knowing she would kill him wasn't enough to completely kill his attraction. It wasn't hard to imagine just how quickly Dove would have died by her hands, were he still living. He'd have invited her to a private room within 10 seconds of seeing her, then been exsanguinated. He would probably say he'd have died happy. Since you admit I can't trust you, he said slowly. Then I want to say something clearly. I would be grateful if you didn't hurt any of the people staying here. The women and children have suffered greatly. I would spare them further pain if I could help it. One elegant eyebrow arched. You think I would prey on these people? It was a nice sentiment to hear, but he was confused. You wouldn't, he asked. From what he knew of the vampire, she didn't care much for mortals of any variety. They were food to her, little more than cattle. Your side. You can put your mind at rest. I have no intention of feeding on these humans. For now, I am well sated. I have no urgent need to slake my thirst. They are safe from me. For now, her eyes glinted. Once again he caught a glimpse of the wild beast that dwelt within that alluring shell. For now she confirmed. If my need grows dire, then I will feed from whatever source is available. All I can promise you is, that should the need arise, they will not suffer. So saying, she turned and walked away, soon vanishing into the shadows, and disappearing from the courtyard altogether. Tyron stared after her for a minute before he shook off his daze. That had been far more of a concession than he'd been expecting from her. She'd never indicated anything other than complete contempt for the living before. Was there something about these survivors in particular that Yor would avoid harming them if she could? Or was she just trying to keep him happy in the hopes he would accept her offer? The thought worried him, but he pushed it away. He'd learned other things that would need to be dealt with. The farmhouses had grown dark now, only a few candles lit inside the buildings, casting a tiny flickering light outside. With a word, Tyron summoned a globe to illuminate his path, and rushed back into the home he shared with Dove. How'd it go, kid? Good chat with a dead guy. 
In a way, apparently, the people we fought here were only half of them. The other half went with the leader to recruit at another farm. Well, shit. That's not good. No, it isn't. There could be as many as 20 or 30 coming back, and we have no idea when they might get here. Last time they got spooked by the skeletons and ran for it. But they'll be ready this time, assuming they meet up with the others. Without the advantage of surprise, his skeletons wouldn't be as effective. They were decent enough fighters, especially against former farmhands without any combat skills. But they weren't reliable in a fight where they were outnumbered. More minions than the enemy was the safest place to be. I've got a lot of work to do tire and fretted. I need to raise more skeletons. Anything less than 20 won't be nearly enough. You've got enough remains Dove pointed out. You could even work on some bone armor with the leftovers. A beat. Or you could just run for it the skull pointed out. You have no obligation to be here when those thugs get back. Tyron froze. It was an option. That was definitely true. What about the survivors? He said. Kid, they don't have to be here either. They can run like hell back east, and they'll bump into slayers and marshals eventually. That's too dangerous Tyron frowned, with the Riftkin still out there, they won't make it far. Having to travel with the kids, there's no chance they'd even outrun the bandits, and they would go looking for them. You know that dove, surely. The skull was silent for a moment. Just be careful kid he said finally. You have no reason to get yourself killed protecting others. You think these people would protect you? From the marshals? From the magisters? They'll hand you over with a smile, no matter what you might have done for them. You almost died for them already. That should be more than enough. Don't forget who you are, Tyron. Don't forget the situation you are in. You're an outlaw, just the same as those bandits are. And if the marshals catch up with you, you'll share the same fate. Don't make an emotional decision, that's all I'm saying. Tyron clenched his fists. In many ways, Dove was right. He knew that. He understood it. But that didn't mean that he had to accept it. I'm not going to leave them to die, he growled. He stalked his way upstairs, sat down at a table covered in bones, and got to work. Chapter 62 Tyron pushed the fatigue away and worked through the night. He pushed his magic relentlessly, examining bones, checking them for leaks, repairing any damage he could, and then trying to work out how the bone armor spell worked. He hadn't had much time to play with it, just like a few other things he had learned recently. The little he'd been able to understand of what he'd received was that he could use existing bones as a form of protection, but exactly how didn't quite make sense to him. Was he able to bind them to himself or to his skeletons? Imagining skeletons wearing bones on top of bones was a strange image. Would he be able to fuse the bones together into plates of armor? Or perhaps he could attach them to his minions to absorb damage. Out came his reliable aid, the notebook and quill, and he got to work transcribing his thoughts. Over time he was able to tease out fragments of knowledge he had and begin to piece together a more complete picture. It was absorbing work, and he lost himself in the scratch of pen on paper as he wrote down sigils in certain combinations, crossed them out and started over again and again. After going through this process multiple times he was able to make more rapid progress than in the past. The pieces might be different, but he'd had a lot of experience putting puzzles together lately. Some of the strategies were sure to transfer. Every now and again he would take a break and work with the bones, emptying his mind and employing his magic, before going back to the book to try again. Halfway through the night he had a working model, though he labored on it further, trying to understand it better before he attempted it. There was little chance he could work on improving or adjusting the spell with a single night's work but he would do everything he could to tease out as many wrinkles as he could. Practice makes perfect, Beery told him. He'd found her playing flames across her fingers at the kitchen table during one of their stays. He'd been 10 years old. Or 11. She smiled as she watched the fire dance, guiding it with nothing but the force of her will. It's foolish to use magic in battle that you haven't honed to the utmost degree. Even reaching the maximum level isn't enough, you should be as familiar with it as you are with breathing. The same goes for swordsmanship. Your father practices every day, despite being the best. Why do you think that is? Like everything his mother had ever told him, it was good advice. Unfortunately his current circumstances made it all but impossible to follow that wisdom. If he had the time, he would gladly refine his techniques to a razor sharp point, before putting himself in harm's way but he didn't have that luxury. If this ability could help keep him alive, 
then he would use it regardless of the risk. Dive into stories, embrace enchantment. An A V mu L B inverted exclamation point N. In the hours before dawn, he began to doubt himself. Should he be creating new minions right now? He had the bones available, he could stitch a few together at least, bringing his numbers back to an even 10. But he hesitated. He wanted to see the results of his current tests as his next round of skeletons. Ten complete sets of bones were currently separated and spread through the second floor, gradually building up a concentration of death magic within each other. Once they were ready, he had a feeling they would become the best servants he'd ever made. At the very least, he expected to learn something significant. But if the thugs returned while he waited, what would he do? He didn't have enough minions to fight off 20 or more men even if they had been farmers and laborers before the break. Unable to contain his fears any longer, he pushed his notes aside and began to prepare two fresh skeletons. Despite his fatigue, the work was familiar and in a strange way, relaxing. Sense the bones, repair them, prepare them and then move on to the stitching. His hands danced through the air ceaselessly as he wove the intricate patterns necessary to allow his undead to move. Threads of magic connected to the tips of each finger bound and curled around each other as he worked. When the two skeletons were ready he performed a ritual, his focus in hand, the words rumbling from his mouth to change reality, as he created a twisted mockery of life. With the two minions ready, he felt somewhat assured and returned to his work. Ten skeletons was hardly better than eight in fighting the sort of numbers he feared would come, but with this many, he may be able to drive them off once more. His support spells were becoming a force multiplier for his undead, and he had a decent reservoir of spare energy now, even when maintaining ten skeletons. Perhaps the bone armor would take up some of that. A few hours after the sun had risen, he began his first trial of the spell. Arranged on the floor around him were a selection of dozens of bones, most of them the longer variety. Shins, femurs, radius and armor, though a decent number of smaller varieties were mixed in. He blinked his eyes a few times trying to drive away the grainy feeling before he began to work the spell. The energy began to flow from his body, into the air, and then to infuse the bones around him. He wasn't trying to fill them or bind them together, as he did when creating a minion, instead he was connecting them to each other, but also to himself. Glowing with the distinct dark aura of death magic, the bones drifted through the air before they began to arrange themselves on Tyron's body. When the process was complete, the necromancer inspected himself with a complicated expression on his face. Suffused with magic, the bones added a layer of protection, he couldn't deny that. They formed a strange sort of armor that covered his arms, chest, back and thighs. He wasn't completely encased in it at least. There were gaps between that would certainly allow an arrow head through, if the shooter were accurate enough. Was someone to try and cut him, though, they would need to cut at least one bone before they bit into his flesh. The spell did what was advertised it formed a layer of protection formed from bones which was certainly useful. It was just, do I really want to walk around covered in human bones? Tyron muttered to himself. To top it off, he probably looked ridiculous. Actually, should he even be worrying about that? Some of these bones belonged to the men the bandits had impaled, the men whose widows were still here on the farm. What in the name of the divines would they think if they saw him? He almost dismissed the spell on the spot, but decided against it. He at least wanted to get Dove's opinion on it. You look like a fucking idiot. Yes, I was worried about that tyrant slumped. In truth, it shouldn't matter if he looked stupid, so long as the spell helped keep him alive. Even though he knew that. Hang on kid, don't dismiss it just yet. Let me get a better look. The eyes of the skull glowed bright with the characteristic dark purple, as Dove took a better look at him. Truth be told, you look stupid all the time. So I'm not sure the bones have much of an impact on that. Dove said, on the plus side, any help surviving is good. It's not like you have a spare set of armor in your back pocket. My father told me never to use armor I wasn't trained for, Tyron said hesitantly. So I never bothered taking any. Good advice, Dove grunted, and the weight can make it harder to cast spells. How are the bones weighing you down? They're surprisingly light to be honest. The necromancer raised and lowered his arms experimentally. But how much protection will I really get from this? Bones are nice and all, but I don't expect them to stop a sword. Don't underestimate them. For starters, there's magic involved, 
so they've likely been hardened by the spell. We may also be able to treat or prepare the bones before you use the spell. This is literally the first time you've used the technique, so don't get too down on it. The summoner made some good points, and Tyron looked down at himself with new eyes, trying to imagine how effective this new spell could be with more investment. How much energy is it taking to maintain it? A fair bit Tyron admitted, not that I don't have enough, but it feels inefficient. Above almost everything else, he had to be efficient with the magic he had available. He needed to have as many minions as possible, and he had to be able to support them to ensure they fought as well as possible. All of it took arcane energy, and no matter how much he had, it never seemed like enough. Finding ways to waste less magic took up much of his time when tweaking his spells at the moment, and likely would into the future. Again, don't stress too much about that, Dove advised him. We can improve it over time. And again, a little protection is better than none. Can you use this on a skeleton as well? Probably. But the cost is too prohibitive for the moment. That might be another avenue to explore in the future. For now you should definitely spend a little time, if you have any to spare, developing this spell. All of this is for nothing if you die. Tyron nodded, then hesitated. Still, I don't really feel comfortable wearing human bones, I know it's useful, but... Kid, it would be a worrying fucking sign if you were suddenly fine walking around with bits of dead people magically attached to you. It's creepy and disgusting. Would I do it? No, not in a million years. Not for all the boobs in all the realms. But you, you're desperate. That tends to limit your choices. It's not ideal, but I think you'll have to get used to the idea. With a little luck any morons we run into might decide your love of corpses has driven you insane and flee the moment they catch a glimpse. Unlikely. Anything is possible. There came a knock at the door, and the two froze for a moment. That's not their husband's, is it? Dove whispered. Yes, it bloody is. Tyron hissed. Oh, shit. That's I'm going to sleep. The light began to fade from the sockets of the skull. Dove, don't you dare. Some things I simply can't bear to see. This is one of them. Good luck. Tyron cursed under his breath as the glow faded to nothing. The knock came again, and his mind raced to think of a way to avoid this scenario unfolding. Perhaps if he stayed quiet. But what if it was important? Could he afford to? The decision was made for him when the door handle began to turn. With no further recourse he leapt forward to grip it from the other side, and brace the door with his foot. Ah, he hello, he stammered. I, I uh, don't think you should come in right now. I'm doing magic. It was so lame even he had to roll his eyes. Surely he could have come up with something better than that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. The voice on the other side of the door was soft and hesitant, one that he didn't recognize. Someone he hadn't spoken to, most likely. There was silence for a few moments as Tyron stood, braced against the door to prevent it opening. Yes. He asked was there something. Ah, uh, yes. Annette sent me. I, I was to tell you that one of the boys spotted people from the south window. Her voice trembled with fear as she spoke, and Tyron could practically feel her broken thoughts dart away from memories she didn't want to touch. Go and lock your building. He told her, trying to sound confident. I'll take a look and see if they want to talk. Nobody is going to hurt you. Th thank you. The presence stepped away on unsteady feet as Tyron slowly released his grip on the doorknob. He swallowed, his mouth suddenly dry. It was too soon. The skeletons upstairs wouldn't be ready for hours. He gambled they'd be ready in time, and it seemed as if he'd lost. He cursed himself. Too greedy, you idiot. Always too greedy. Should have played it safe. At least he'd listened to his instinct enough to raise another two minions. He considered waking Dove but decided that he didn't have the time. With a thought he summoned the skeletons to himself as he prepared to step outside. His sword belted to his waist, and with a fully armed contingent of skeletons, Tyron opened the door on the outward facing side of the building. Hopefully the widows and children were busy boarding up and locking their building, but he'd rather not be seen by them if he could avoid it. There was no need to traumatize the kids any more than they had been. He walked around the outside of the farmhouses until he reached the southern side. It wasn't difficult to spot the group approaching. In fact, they made no effort at all to conceal themselves. There were only five of them, which was a relief. If they meant to attack immediately, surely they would have brought everyone. Or they've sent the others around the sides. Despite being flattened and trampled by the Rivkin, the fields surrounding the farmhouses 
were filled with places to hide amongst the crops. There could be a thousand men out there and he wouldn't know it. Tyron frowned and sent five of his minions into the courtyard. Not just to protect the others, but to watch his back. He didn't want to get surrounded without a path of retreat. He watched carefully as the five in the distance continued to walk along the road only to blink repeatedly when they stopped a hundred meters from the buildings. He waited for them to approach further but they didn't move. Apparently they wanted him to come to them. He was willing to compromise to a point. He walked out his minions in front until he had covered half the distance between them. Then he stopped. The two sides appraised each other for a time. Tyron had made no attempt to hide what he was. The skeletons wore no hoods or cloaks, and he could see the unease on the faces of the men as they gazed on his undead. He also noticed they didn't much like looking at him either. For a moment he couldn't realize why then remembered he was still covered in literal human bones. Dove had been right. In contrast, the five men before him didn't seem all that impressive. Humble, dirty clothing covered their sun-darkened laborer frames. Of the four, only the one in front stood out. More confident than the others, he stood with one thumb hooked into the front of his overalls, and a hat pulled low over his face. Are any of you named Monty by any chance? Tyron called out and broke the uneasy silence. Aye, that would be me. The man in front smiled easily. Who might you be, lad? Tyron ignored the question and the slight insult. Davin says hello, he said. Monty raised a brow. He's alive. No. The necromancer tapped the bones protecting his chest. Though, in a way, I feel as if he's still with me. Do you take my meaning? The man grinned before he leaned forward and spat on the ground. You're a piece of work aren't you lad? Walking in front of us, disrespecting the remains of our friend. Tyron could sense his mistake as the bandit leader spoke. The fear remained in the eyes of the others, but there was anger there now as well. Not sure if that's an insult or a compliment coming from a motoring rapist Monty. Ah, now that might be fair enough. Strew, after all, I've broken the law of the land, all the boys are they, and will hang fur it should the marshals get hold of us. Blue eyes glittered like ice chips beneath the brim of the hat. But that's something we are they in common, lad. Something tells me the magic you done with the dead ain't exactly smiled upon. Seems like we might be in a similar position right now, when it comes to witnesses. Tyron nodded slowly. He understood what the scum was driving at. The bandits couldn't allow the women and children to survive, otherwise they'd be arrested and killed, once order returned. They had always planned to kill them and in their eyes, Tyron intended to do the same. After all, he couldn't conceal his passage with all of these living witnesses, and what dark magic wielding mage would tolerate that? The difference between Tyron and the bandits though, was that they could freely speak to the marshals, and submit to a status ritual, unless every single one of them had been stupid enough to accept an illegal subclass. They would be able to get the law on their side, something he could never do. He grit his teeth. If he were even 20 meters closer, he'd likely take a shot with a magic bolt and try to take the man's head clean off. What do you want, Monty? Speak plainly. He affected a bored attitude. The former farmhand spread his palms wide, an affable expression on his face. We'd be happy if you just decided to walk away. Leave the women folk here and we'll be making sure they don't have much to say to the law. In return, we'll keep our mouths shut. No need to go spooking the marshals about the walking dead. In other words, move along. Let them re-establish their little slice of paradise, and they'd kill everyone and promise not to rat him out. It was bullshit of course. They had no reason to keep their word, and would probably just ambush him on the road when he tried to leave anyway. Besides that Tyron had decided he would stand for something, and this wasn't it. Let me be clear, he said, his voice cold. If you want these farms back, if you want those women and children back, then you come and take them. Bring everyone you have and die like the cowardly human filth that you are. I'll be delighted to rip the bones from your flesh and send your souls howling into the abyss, before I raise you to serve my purpose. He leaned forward and spat on the road in front of him, before he turned on his heel and strode toward the farms. You Surin, that's what you want? Monty called at his back. No need to be dire now. He didn't respond, there wasn't anything to say. Hopefully they'd give him enough time to prepare his defenses. If they waited until nightfall maybe you'll would like to spend a little time with those gentlemen. Chapter 63 So you had a chat with the bandit leader and told him to fuck off. Pretty much Tyron confirmed. 
You really intend to die for a group of women and children. I mean, noble as hell, admirable even, but I didn't think this was your goal. Didn't you have some shit you wanted to do? Dove sounded exasperated, and he was. He sympathized with Tyron's position, he wasn't a monster. The poor widows they'd found had been abused, raped and forced to watch their families die, alongside their children. It was inhumane and cruel on an almost comedic level. Why the hell were a bunch of idiot farmhands putting people through this ridiculous level of suffering? So the kid wanted to protect them, obviously, that was the natural impulse. But Dove couldn't shake the opinion that if he stayed and tried to fight, he would most likely die. Tyron, as much as you might feel like a badass, you have to keep in mind how weak you are the Skull tried to explain. You're still not level 20, still with your base class. Your stat gain is basement level horse done, and you've no access to advanced skills and spells. You're as weak as the piss they pass for beard back at the Knight's Corner. Holy hell that pub had sucked. Anyway, if you try and fight 30 men by yourself, even laborers, you are going to get your clock cleaned. That's not a good thing, by the way. The necromancer frowned, irritated. And so what if you're right? Just because I'm likely to lose, I'm supposed to walk away. Leave those people to suffer and then be murdered at the hands of scum. You'd be alive, which would give you a hell of a lot more agency than if you were dead, you hear me. Once you die, it's over for most people. My situation seems to be a little unique. You wouldn't be around to raise yourself. Tyron placed both his hands flat on the table. I know you're only looking out for me, and more than that, I know that you're right. I probably can't win. I will most likely get myself killed and that'll be the end of it. But I promised myself, Dove, I promised that when I started this, I would use my class to help people. It would be almost impossible to find a more clear-cut moral decision than this one. I have to stay and prove that necromancers don't have to be evil, that I can save lives and contribute even with this class. The young man's eyes burned with determination, and Dove could only sigh as he realized he wasn't going to convince him. I hate to break it to you, kid, but I seriously doubt they will ever change their opinion on the legality of necromancers. That doesn't mean I don't try, Tyron stated. Now, enough of this rubbish, we're just wasting time. We need to think about how we win. What's the first move? Pray. Dove. Alright, fine. Let's wait for night time. Hopefully they won't attack before then, and have a chat with your... If you're lucky, she'll let you lose your virginity to her before biting your throat out. That's the only way I can see you getting lucky before death, kid. The young man groaned and leaned forward until his forehead rested on the table's wooden surface. Look, my ability to appreciate the stakes here and take it seriously is a little lacking, and I don't think I'm entirely to blame for that Dove defended himself. If you want some real advice, even though it won't get you laid, you should talk to the widows and ask them to help. If any of them can shoot a bow that'll be a huge help. I talked to them before I came back here Tyron spoke without lifting his head from the table. Their lives are at risk. I had to tell them first. That's a surprisingly mature move of you. How'd they take the news? How do you think? I think they were traumatized all over again. Exactly. But, and this is crucial, can any of them shoot a bow? Annette said they would do what they can. They know they can't run, and aren't exactly happy about the idea of going back under the thumb of Monty. They're acting as lookouts for us right now. There's someone in each of the four buildings on the second floor. Right. That's awesome. Tyron lifted his head, the skin having gone red from being pressed into the hard surface. Any other bright ideas? He asked the skull. Dove thought for a moment. Not much to be honest. You need more minions, you know that much. Either you hold off for a few more hours and use the ones upstairs. Or you get to work on some fresh bones now. Other than that, there isn't much you can do. Unless you have other magic you can draw on in a pinch. Ah, the necromancer hesitated. He could use a ritual and contact one of the patrons. The only issue being, he had no idea if their intervention would be a help or a hindrance. What would happen if he contacted the court again? Another vampire dropping in on him. Perhaps one less willing to wait before turning him into an undead, blood-drinking nightmare. No thanks. The Abyss. He may be able to learn something useful, but he may lose his sanity in exchange. He wasn't so foolish to assume he had experienced the worst of what that strange realm had to offer. As for the Dark Ones who knew, despite his dire circumstances, 
He didn't feel he could justify taking the risk of enacting one of the rituals he had learned from Anathema. And he was surprisingly comfortable with that. The decision had been made to avoid leaning on the subclass as much as possible. And he wanted to stick to that. No, he shook his head. I haven't gotten anything I can use. Then we are back to bony boys, Dove said. If someone is looking out for you, then get upstairs and work on them bones. You aren't much good for anything else. As much as Tyron wanted to argue that point, he couldn't. At his level, with the collection of skills and spells that he had, he wasn't useful outside of creating minions. Alright, you might as well come up too. He grabbed the skull with one hand, and made his way to the second floor. Checking in on his tests, he could tell the bones were nearing full saturation. In a few hours he'd be able to use them to raise new skeletons. But did he dare wait that long? Did he have to? Can you think of a reason I couldn't gather some of the bones together and start threading them? He asked. Dove thought for a moment. Not off the top of my bald shiny head. As far as we know, the bones won't start to form a wild undead unless there's enough skeleton to create a functional one. If you put the leg bones together, they shouldn't start to knit themselves and walk around. Tyron pinched his brow as he considered the problem. We can play it safe enough that even that shouldn't be an issue. I can gather feet and shins together, hands and forearms in another room, then the ribs, spine and hips in another. I'll keep the skulls separate and only bring them in at the last minute. That way I can do almost all the threading in advance, and the bones should gather death magic faster, considering there will be more of them in proximity. Makes sense to me. Crack in. Which is exactly what he did. With the widows and their children on the lookout, he absorbed himself in his work. The necromancer almost ran from room to room, gathering the bones as quickly as he could and placing them in their new configurations. The moment things were in place, he began to work on the threading, starting with the ankle joints. Gathering the many small bones of the feet together and connecting them to the shin was a pain, complex and time-consuming. It was also massively important. Without a properly functioning foot, the resulting minion couldn't even walk, not especially useful, and Tyron has spent a great deal of time fretting over ways to create a better woven joint. He wouldn't say that he'd mastered it, but he'd certainly come a long way from the early days. His more recent minions were better balanced and possessed a much smoother gait which meant they could walk a lot faster. One those were done, he jumped to another room and worked on the hands and wrists. Another finely detailed piece of work. Holding and striking with weapons involved a huge variety of muscles and joints in a human's. And although he didn't need to replicate that level of complexity, he still had to do a lot of threading before his skeletons could articulate all of their fingers and properly rotate their wrists. He completed 10 hands in a row before he ran to another room and started working on 10 spines. All the while he kept checking on the amount of death magic contained in his specimens, waiting for the moment they reached full saturation. They were close now. The flickering energy that moved between them continued its mysterious jumping, leaving behind traces of magic in its wake. Any moment Tyron expected someone to rush into the room he was working in and tell him the bandits were coming or to cry out in fear and pain as Monty and his crew sprung out of the long grass and attacked. But it didn't happen. As he continued to weave one segment after another, sweat dripping from his nose and he concentrated fiercely. Working as quickly but flawlessly as he could, there was no attack. Perhaps his threats had scared the bandits. Perhaps they were waiting for nightfall in order to sneak up on them. Or maybe they'd abandoned the farms, unwilling to fight a strange mage they didn't know or understand. Whatever the case, they gave him enough time to complete his work. Tyron and Dove watched anxiously as the bones continued to accrue death-attributed magic, the energy in each climbing until they were full, at last. The two nervously observed the bones, Tyron carrying his friend and advisor from room to room, as they watched to see if anything would happen. If the arms suddenly came to life and tried to strangle the life out of him, he'd like to see them coming, after all. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Piece by piece, he began to assemble the first skeleton, working on the joints as he brought the legs together, connecting them to the hips, then attached the arms. When everything was in place, he collected the skull and put it down in its place. The moment he did so, he could feel a strange energy come over the remains. The air around the bones was different, and he felt a faint stirring of magic within them. Before anything could happen, he hastily finished his work, stitching the neck together and enacting the ritual. 
As he spoke the words and felt the power flow out of him, Tyron was shocked to realize that something was pushing back against him. But as he exerted his will, it quickly faded, and the spell took hold. Without the need to laboriously fill the skeleton with his own magic, the spell was relatively easy to cast, not requiring him to invest nearly as much arcane energy. He constructed each of the components required for a complete minion, and brought the ritual to an end, watching cautiously, as his new servant pushed itself to its feet. It sat in his mind just the same as any other minion, and responded the same when he gave it instructions. Despite that, he still felt something was different about it. He just couldn't put his finger on what it was. But since it didn't try to bite his face off, he decided that was good enough and got to work on the others. For several hours he worked without rest bringing the bones together, and completing the final elements required at a furious pace, before completing the process with the ritual. Each time, something pushed back on him, but he quashed it successfully and proceeded with the cast. By the time the sun fell, he had ten brand new minions, perhaps his finest to date, lined up before him on the second floor. Anything different about them now that they're all up and together? Dove asked. Tyron stared hard at the skeletons, then extended his senses towards them. There's something. I just can't tell what he muttered. He stepped toward them. Perhaps if I examine them a little closer. A shout went up outside. Or not he said and swiftly ordered all of his skeletons to gather on the ground floor. Chapter 64 20 skeletons. That was the following that Tyron had managed to create after his desperate struggles to master his necromancer class. He was proud of what he'd achieved. He didn't want to be boastful, but he felt certain that under his circumstances, most would struggle to do what he had done or learn what he had learned. Each of the minions stood armed with simple weaponry, swords and axes, though only eight had shields. As the skeletons gathered in the bottom floor of the farmhouse, he could feel the drain on his magic rise precipitously. A full twenty might be more than he could support after all. He rushed over to his back and fumbled around, until he found a few arcane crystals and jammed them into his pocket. He'd likely need them before the fight was done. Kid, take me with you. Tyron screeched to a halt. He turned to stare at the skull sitting motionless on the table, his two eyes aglow with magic. You want to come out there with me? He asked, confused. Heck yes. Do you really think I want to sit here on the table and sleep while there's a fight to the death going on? Besides the fear of missing out on the fun, I do actually have a valid reason for this request. Which is? Tyron prompted uneasily. I refuse to be stuck in this skull for the rest of my afterlife, kid. You agreed to set me free, remember? If it looks like you might lose, I want you to smash my skull and break the ritual. I will not be used as a desk ornament for a horny, murderous farmhand for the next dozen years, alright? So take me with you. Dove Tyron muttered, his hands hanging by his side. He didn't have time to process how he felt about his friend's request. So he snatched the skull from the table in his left hand as he rushed to complete his preparations. I need to figure out a way to attach you to my belt or something he huffed. I want both hands free for this. I'd rather you didn't. I don't especially feel the need to get closer to any bones. If you take my meaning, I get it. I'm talking about your dash. I said I get it. Once he was ready, he ordered his 20 skeletons to step into the courtyard and followed quickly after them. He'd rather not parade his undead in the open where the children could see them, but they had bigger things to worry about right now. When he stepped onto the sandy gravel of the courtyard, he found a net outside, along with a few other widows, each of them armed with the short hunting bows, that were common in the frontier farming communities. As he drew closer he could see the fear in their eyes, several were physically trembling, but also their determination. These women were prepared to fight, how are the others? He asked. Annette shook her head. Not good. I've left Donna and Bridget to watch them and take care of the little ones. They're too frightened to help. Can't really blame them Dove said. These bastards need a right kicking in the balls. When the skull spoke out of the blue, the widows jumped, shocked to hear a voice emanating from human remains. Oh, ah, this is my friend, Dove. I uh, attached his spirit to his skull after he died. At his explanation, four sets of horrified eyes turned themselves from the skull to him. Yeah, I don't think the explanation really helps you out in this case, kid. Should have just told them you found me or something. Is he safe? Annette asked hesitantly. 
Who? Dove. Tyron looked down at the skull clasped in his left hand. Completely. He can't even move. He can see and talk. That's about it. Instead of reminding me how shitty my current circumstances are, maybe we should be getting ready to fight off these assholes. Don't you think? Dove broke in. Right. Annette, you and the other ladies should head to the second floor. That's the safest place to shoot from even if the view isn't the best. What about the roof? She asked. To open he shook his head. Do as much as you can, but try to keep yourselves safe. I've got more minions with me this time. We'll be able to hold them off on the ground. He tried to sound more confident than he was. In truth, he had no idea how well his minions would fare against prepared, human opponents. If the once farmers were able to shake off their fear, they might overpower his comparatively clumsy skeletons in minutes. He'd have to make good use of his other spells to ensure that didn't happen. The ladies ran to reach their posts, and Tyron rushed to do the same. The bandits had been seen coming up the south road, but again, he couldn't bring every minion to that side, in case they circled around. Reluctantly, he left five behind, and took the others through the walkway between buildings to stand on the exterior of the courtyard. A group of men were walking along the dirt road, unhurried and making no attempt to conceal themselves. As he counted their numbers, the young necromancer's heart began to sink. How many, kid? Looks like almost 40. Ouch. Yeah. On the bright side, they have minimal combat skills, probably bugger all levels in anything other than farming, and no feats that aren't related to vegetables and cows. That's true. On the downside, there's 40 of them and only one of you. 21 if you include the skeletons. 25 if we include the widows. Also, your skeletons are completely rubbish when they're outnumbered. That is also true. Thanks Dove. Anytime you need me kid, I'm here for you. As idiotic as it was, the former summoner had a point. His skeletons were fine, good even, but he knew perfectly well that they were far better off when they outnumbered their opponents as opposed to the other way around. In a 3 or 4 to 1 fight, their clumsy movements and wide openings were hard to exploit, but like this, they would be hard pressed to hold their ground. The odds are what they are Tyron said, his expression grim. We may be able to frighten them off. They're not professional soldiers, just thugs. Don't underestimate them, Kid Dove warned. If those farmwives are alive when the slayers come through, then they're dead meat and they know it. They might just be thugs, but they are desperate thugs. If you weren't even more illegal than they are, they'd want you dead just as bad. The idea that he was more wanted than a gang of murderers and rapists was enough to get a wry smile from Tyron despite the circumstances. If only a person's crimes showed on their status sheet, that would simplify a few things. Sadly, that wasn't the world they lived in. As the bandits approached, he overrode Dove's objections and tucked him into the loose belt that held his scabbard. The skull rode on his right hip, nowhere near his groin, but that didn't stop the man from complaining. We're going to have words about this, later he grumbled. You want to be close enough that I can crush you, so I have to do this. It's not like I can wear you like a hat. I'd be a fantastic hat. That's not the point. Now shut up, I need to focus. The necromancer stepped forward and looked up to his right and left. In the windows overlooking the road to the farm, the widows, including Annette, had taken up position, bows clutched in white knuckled grips. He tried to signal something encouraging to them but ended up waving lamely. Not for the first time he wished he had just a dash of his father's easy charm. When the bandits were a hundred meters away, they slowed and stopped as Monty stepped from the crowd and approached another few meters. The man looked much as he had before, except now he carried a crude shield that they'd nailed together using loose wood. Against untrained archers without skills and feats, it would probably do just. Hoy there, lad. The bandit called a smile on his face as he waved lazily. I hope yeah don't mind, I brung a few of me mates back with me. You could state the obvious, or you could say what you want Tyron growled back. He flicked his vision to the minions in the courtyard for a moment, nothing yet. The crook may be trying to stall him out, so he'd need to keep his eyes open. His reply only broadened the grin on Monty's face, as he held his hands wide. Same as before, lad. You can piss off and we'll be having these here farms back. The women and children. The group behind Monty laughed, and the man himself chuckled openly. I will be having them too. These guys fucking suck Dove muttered. I've seen some real top grade pricks in my time, but holy shit. 
Like I told you before, if you want them, come up here and pay the price. All I want is your bones. Tyron reached out and grasped one of his new skeletons by the wrist, lifting the limb and making the skeleton wave back and forth at the bandits. Your friends seem happy with the arrangement. The laughter switched to ugly muttering as he mocked their dead friends. The expression on Monty's face hardened. Do you know what it's like, lad? Tarby given farmer as yeah class. You want sympathy from me? Tyron called, incredulous. Might be a little late for that, you piece of filth. Oh, I. We done terrible things. But that's what it takes to change your fate. See, most of the lads were raised out here, working odd jobs until we get our class. Farmer, or laborer, or tradesman. Then we supposed to go make a life for ourselves. But it's a little hard to be a farmer. When your family can't feed you, let alone buy a farm. The men all nodded, their faces hard as they stared up at the farmhouses. So what are we supposed to do? We sign on as farmhands for richer men, and slave away making money for someone else. Not much of a life if you ask me. Then the monsters came, and we got ourselves a little chance. We can finally make something of ourselves. You wanted the land, so you killed the men who owned it. You really think you could just take their place, and nobody would notice. Well now, who's to say it weren't the kin that did it? Ain't nobody around who can say otherwise. Well, there won't be. And their wives and children. Did they have to suffer like they did? Monty held his hands up, palms out, and shrugged. That's just a side benefit, as it were, he laughed. The blood boiled in Tyron's veins. Come up and die, Monty, he called back. I've nothing else to say to you while you're living. You might be some fancy mage, lad, but you can't beat this many of us. Give it up and walk away. Tyron turned his back on the man and stepped back into the protective ring of skeletons. The bandit leader could shout all the nonsense he wanted, he wasn't going anywhere. He quickly ran through the spells he could utilize in this situation and tried to decide which he should prepare first. He was so deep in thought, he didn't even realize that Monty had started calling to the widows. Whatever had been said was lost to him, but the reply certainly wasn't. Die you fucking bastards. Annette screamed as she leaned out the window, her face twisted with rage, as she let fly an arrow from her bow. The shot sailed through the air in a graceful arc, and sank deep into the leg of a bandit who stumbled to the side with a cry of pain, clutching at his wound. This signaled the other widows, who also fired their first arrows out of the upstairs windows. Under fire, the former farmhands rushed to protect themselves, their crude shields coming to the fore. After a few moments of arranging themselves, they charged toward the farmhouses, giving a ragged cry. If I die today, instead of these shitmongers, I'm going to be very upset with you, Tyre and Dove remarked. The young necromancer gripped the hilt of his sword tight. Me too. Chapter 65. The arrows continued to be fired from above, but little resulted from it. These weren't professional archers or even casual hunters shooting, after all but it forced the bandits to approach with a little caution, and Tyron was grateful for the extra time. Any advice? He asked, his voice shaking. Not really. Try to keep a cool head. Remain aware of your surroundings, that's about it. I, I'll try. That's the spirit. Now, come on, kill some shit. The words of his friend twisted in his gut slightly. Despite everything that had happened, he still found it difficult to kill people. It's either them or you, Tyron. You wouldn't blink twice if you'll kill them, do it? The young necromancer grit his teeth and hardened his will. He wouldn't die here, he refused to allow it. The bandits advanced steadily, huddled together with their crude shields held high. 40 meters. 30 meters. The moment they crossed that threshold, Tyron stepped forward. He spoke the words, snapped out a few gestures and then thrust his palm forward. The magic bolt sped from his open hand, crunching into a leading man's thigh. The bandit cried out and collapsed to one knee, as the others flicked their eyes from the windows to the young mage. Tyron's hands were already moving when someone, possibly Monty, yelled run. The second bolt flying out to slam into a shield that dropped just enough to take the blow. As a group they charged, rushing over the final gap, as the necromancer skipped back into the protective ring of skeletons his hands already in motion as the words of power rolled from his tongue. The two lines clashed with shouts of anger from the bandits and cold, emotionless steel from the skeletons. With their shields up, his front rank of minions absorbed the initial blows, but were pushed backwards by the belligerent men. Tyron felt his magic reserves drop precipitously. 
As the skeletons drew deeply on his power to strengthen themselves, bony heels dug into the grit and skeletal fingers cold around the handles of their weapons as the purple fire in their eyes ignited all the brighter. In the relatively narrow gap between buildings, the bandits couldn't use their full numbers to beat down on his minions, but they could brace against each other and push into his line. Unable to match the force being applied to them, his front line began to buckle. He couldn't panic. If he lost his composure and failed to cast, he was dead. Words and gestures came together in a final flourish as he completed the spell. Death Blades. The dark energy of death manifested around the blades of his minions, causing the bandits to pull back slightly. When the skeletons struck, their blades bit deeper than before, in power by his spell. It was an equalizer, but not enough on its own. No time to rest. Tyron snatched an arcane crystal from his pouch, and stuffed it between his teeth, before he began to cast again. The sound of metal on metal. The shouts and screams of combat, the faces twisted with rage in front of him combined to overwhelm his senses. The young mage pushed his concentration to the limit and took another long step back to put more distance between himself and the brawl as he continued to work. The shivering curse would help even the playing field even further, slowing and weakening the bandits. Once that spell was in place, he'd be free to cast bolts or attempt to dominate minds to tip the balance even further. Get the fuck up. He heard Monty yell as the bandits surged again, shoving into the skeleton wall. Hard. Once he's dead it's over. You have to get past the minions first, idiot Tyron sneered in his mind as he continued to cast his spell. A dull impact rocked his left side, throwing off his rhythm. Surprised, he glanced down to see a hand axe lodged into his bone armor. A second later, the pain blossomed as blood began to flow. He froze in shock for a full second before he ducked to the side, just in time to avoid another axe hold from the rear of the bandit pack. Fuck. He cursed as he used his right hand to pull the crude hatchet from his shoulder. A roar went up from the bandits when they realized he'd been wounded, and they surged again. The skeletons pushed back, drawing more power from their master to fight. Tyron grimaced and sucked on the mage candy harder, trying to supplement his own energy. A quick flex of his left hand revealed the extent of the damage. He could use it, but it hurt like hell. If he hadn't had the bone armor on, it would have gone much deeper, perhaps even lodged in the bone. You blasted idiot, he cursed himself. Of course, they could throw shit at him. They might not be trained soldiers, but they were smart enough to throw a damned axe or knife. He'd looked down on them. He twitched as he felt one of his skeletons go down. They'd managed to grip its shield and pull it forward away from the others. Exposed, a sharp blow to the skull had been enough to see it off. Not going out like this. No fucking way. To make himself a harder target, Tyron slid down onto his knees and began to cast the Shivering Curse once more. The pain in his shoulder was fierce, but he forced himself to bear it. He couldn't afford the delay a one-handed cast would cost him. Another skeleton went down as the fighting at the front intensified. Monty was urging his men to push forward, his voice rising above the din as he cursed and roared at them to fight harder. It wasn't going well. Don't think about it. Focus. Nothing mattered but the spell. Finish the spell. Shivering curse. The moment the spell completed, he felt the heat around him drain away. In the epicenter of the magic, it was sure to feel much worse. The cold suffused air began to leach into the bandits, slowing their movements and buying more time. What the hell is this? The slight hint of fear in that voice was music to Tyron's ears. If one broke and ran, more would follow. He rose from the ground but kept his head down, wary of being hit again. Blood continued to flow from his wound, and he could only spit in frustration that he hadn't brought anything to bandage himself or stem the flow. He flicked his eyes upward. It was still light, but not for long. Every minute brought the sun lower on the horizon. Ignore it. Push through. Monty bellowed. The second rank of skeletons thrust their weapons awkwardly, not coordinated enough to take advantage of the narrow openings when they appeared. Even so, They'd managed to score a hit here and there. Several of the bandits were bleeding, and several more had suffered from wounds inflicted by the archers above. Annette was still screaming and shouting like a demon, as were a few others, but Tyron couldn't hear well enough to know what they were saying. Perhaps just as well. He clutched at the sword on his waist again, but let it go just as quickly. With his poor skill, there was no point drawing it. He needed another spell. The necromancer locked eyes with one of the bandits in the front row. A scruffy bearded man who looked no older than 25. Muscled like a smith or laborer, 
He sported a savage grin as he rammed his crude shield against the skeleton line over and over, trying to break them. You'll do. Deftly, he wove together a shorter magic, desperate to slow the enemy's momentum. Fear. Suppress mine may have worked, but he didn't want to expose himself to a potentially difficult battle of wills in the middle of the fight. He'd be unable to focus on himself and likely be brained by a thrown brick or some other nonsense. Instead, he wanted to weaken the bandit front line. What better way than to inflict them with fear? A wry grunt of satisfaction left him as he felt the spell complete and take hold, his target immediately stiffening, eyes going wide. There were many aspects to the spell that Tyron didn't understand. But he knew enough to understand that the magic was somewhat akin to a spike, one that drove deep into the target mind, and unleashed something upon it. The powerfully built bandit began to shake as his wild eyes flicked around himself as if seeing things that weren't there. Low, pitiful moans dripped from his lips, almost inaudible in the din, and his arms fell limp by his side as he tried to flinch away from the skeletons in front of him. Magic Bolt. The spell slammed into the man's exposed head with a sickening crunch, and down he went. Confused shouts rose from amongst the bandits as they pulled their man back, but Monty's voice rose over all of them. Get that fucking kid. Tyron ducked as a wave of thrown weapons came his way. Half a dozen of them crashing into his skeletons and throwing them off balance. The others missing their target entirely. Who's next? He yelled back at them. He put all the confidence he could muster into his tone. But inside, he didn't feel it. He clutched at his wounded shoulder with his right hand. His clothes were slick with blood now. He was starting to feel lightheaded. That wasn't good. He was preparing to start another spell when he realized someone was tugging on his cloak. He spun quickly, throwing the small boy behind him off balance and down into the dirt. The kid looked up at him with fear and cringed. What? Tyron demanded. Quickly. The boy shivered before he raised a shaking hand pointing back to the courtyard. More come he stammered. From the south. Shit. Get back inside. Hurry he urged the boy as he pulled him up with his good arm and pushed him back toward the house. A quick cast of minion sight confirmed what the kid had said. His five reserve skeletons could see men approaching, though he couldn't be sure how many there were. In a minute, they'd be in the courtyard. What could he do? By the five, what could he do? He tried to calm down and think. He could abandon the fight here and try to deal with this new group. His skeletons would fare much worse without his support. Death blades and the shivering curse wouldn't last forever. And when they ran out, the remaining bandits would make short work of his minions. But if he could finish the others and come back before that happened, he may still be able to hold. He could order his minions to return and protect his back from this new group. He'd be fighting on both sides, but he'd be surrounded by skeletons and able to influence both fronts at least. But that would mean nothing was preventing the new group from entering the houses. Damn it he ground out. He ordered his remaining minions to hold the line, turned and dashed away as he ripped his sword free. His left hand felt numb now, but he could still move it. That would have to do. He ran to where his five minions were gathered, and directed them forward to confront the new group. When they came into sight, his heart sank. There were ten of them, grinning as they swung their crude weapons back and forth in their calloused and dirty hands. Oi there, lad one laughed, ready to get what's coming to ya. Tyron flashed a magic bolt straight into his gut. Shut up and die he spat. I don't have the time. As one of their number collapsed with a groan, clutching at his belly, the smug looks vanished from the other's faces, and they advanced quickly to engage his skeletons. No time to work up a spell. Tyron realized his magic was draining incredibly rapidly and crunched down on the crystal in his mouth, shattering it instantly. He snatched another from his pouch and threw it in his mouth, before he brought his blade up to divert a crude swing. He hadn't trained in a long time, and it showed in his clumsy form. His father would have shaken his head in despair, if he'd seen how slow his son's rippest had been. But in the moment, Tyron didn't care. By some miracle, he actually connected and cut a deep line in his attacker's arm, before he shuffled back to make some space. Outnumbered, his skeletons were being battered, and there were still two more men coming after him, as the one he'd injured picked himself up and swapped weapon hands. Yeah, fucking dead the bandit growled. You first Tyron growled back. The two men rushed him, and Tyron tried to slip to his right, slashing a wide cut to discourage them, but his footing was terrible. Off balance, the swing lacked power, and the farmhand battered it aside with what looked like a woodcutter's axe. 
pull it back faster than you send it out, his father's voice whispered in his ear, attack fast, regain your form faster, that's the key, he moved almost instinctively, pulling the blade back to himself, as the axeman brought his weapon high with a bellow, the point does more damage than the blade, son, the blade's the flashy bit, the point is for killing, it was a terrible stab. His weight wasn't fully behind the strike. The line of his arms wasn't correct. The angle of the blade wasn't straight. But against an unarmored man, it hardly mattered. Before the axe could come crashing down on him, the blade slid straight through the bandit. Between the fifth and sixth rib, he noted detached. The air burst out of the man and he dropped. Tyron watched the light fade from his eyes for a short moment before his other opponent attacked, slamming into his left side and knocking him off his feet. Tyron sprawled in the dirt, trying to avoid landing on his injury as he rolled. He tried to bring his blade up, but the bandit was there too fast. Metal flashed in the dying light, and Tyron scrambled to one side, narrowly avoiding the strike. He got back to his feet just in time to catch the next attack on his blade. The bandit surged forward, locking their two weapons together as he tried to use his weight to bear down on him. The man's stinking breath blew straight into his face, and the mage quickly realized this was a fight he was going to lose. With his left arm injured and with less physical strength, he'd be overpowered in short order. Drop the left and cast a bolt as quick as I can. Just as he pulled his left hand from the hilt and began to flick the gestures required, something speared into his opponent in the corner of his vision. The bandit went stiff, just as shocked as Tyron before he collapsed to the side. Stunned, Tyron turned to see a furious farm wife, tears running down her face, with a pitchfork gripped in both hands. Glynis, he gaped. Kill the bastards. She screamed as she ran forward, half a dozen others on her heels. Chapter 66. The furious farmwives crashed into the fight with whatever tools they'd had at hand. Stunned as he was, Tyron didn't have time to gape at the spectacle. As the man before him staggered with a pitchfork rammed into his side, the necromancer hastily slashed him across the throat and pushed forward to engage another. With bone armor providing at least some level of protection, he would rather the bandits targeted him than the unarmored women. But those women didn't seem to share his concern. As he rushed to fight, he was confronted by the scene of enraged mothers stabbing, bashing and cutting, making their attacks with no regard for their own safety. The melee was so brutal, he didn't see an opportunity to throw a magic bolt, without risking serious injury to the people he wanted to protect. You piece of shit. Glynis screamed as she rushed forward, blood dripping from the prongs of her pitchfork. Tyron's five skeletons had already been reduced to three when the help had arrived, but now the numbers advantage had tilted in their favor. Cursing solidly, he adjusted his grip and stepped around the melee, looking for an opening. The moment he found one, he lunged forward putting his weight behind the blade as well as he could with one uninjured arm. Once again, he felt the point slide through living flesh as he punctured a human being. The breath rushing out of the man as his lung collapsed. Tyron ripped the blade free just in time to deflect a wide, horizontal swing that threatened to take his head off. The bandit's eyes were wild, his face twisted into a snarl that Tyron didn't realize was matched on his own. Bigger and stronger, the criminal bull rushed him, weapon held defensively and shoulder lowered. The necromancer could barely remember the footwork his father had taught him, but he managed to slide out of the way just in time. His blade cut a clumsy line as he moved barely enough to draw blood, and he cursed his lack of speed. The wound further enraged his opponent, who bellowed like an animal, and turned to charge again. Someone was screaming nearby, a high-pitched wail that drilled into Tyron's ears. Had one of the widows been injured, the thought distracted him for a fraction of a second, enough that this time, he was too slow to move. Wise to his movement, the bandit tracked him better as he tried to sidestep. Tyron's eyes widened as he saw the steel coming towards him. At the last second he rotated his wrists and tried to parry. Pain ignited across his hip on the right side, and he hissed as the bandit crashed into him sending them both sprawling onto the ground. Blood welled from the new wound, soaking into his pants. He was already starting to feel cold. This was the last thing he needed. He dropped his sword before he landed, thudding into the ground and knocking the wind out of him temporarily. His opponent was more sprightly and scrambled after him on his hands and knees, murder in his eyes. Tyron sucked in a breath before his hands began to move, and his tongue obeyed him. Magic Bolt. 
He flung his hand forward and flung the missile forward, where it crunched into the man's head less than a meter from his palm. Blood splattered across his face, forcing him to blink and wipe at his face as he tried to clear his vision. He pushed himself off the ground and gathered his sword before staggering back to the bandit now writhing on the ground, clutching what remained of his face. A swift stab to the chest finished him and the necromancer blearily turned to find his next opponent. Except there wasn't one. The skeletons, what was left of them, shuffled over to him as the widows hurled abuse at the bandits who had turned and fled, leaving half their number dead on the ground. Not without inflicting casualties. More than one of the bodies slumped in the dirt didn't belong to their attackers. Make sure they don't come back he rasped to no one in particular. I'm going back to the other side. I can come with you. Glynis stepped forward, determined to help. Tyron just shook his head. You need to be ready in case the skeletons fall. If I fail, then you need to fight them off yourselves. His wounds burned with pain, but he grit his teeth and pushed through it. If he fell down now, what would happen to his minions? They'd lose quickly without his support. So he limped and cursed his way across the courtyard, and back to where the brawl continued on the other side. Kid. You're leaking a bit more than a person, Ort Dove remarked from his waist. No shit, Tyron coughed. Thanks for the insight. You should get yourself bandaged. Do it yourself or let one of the widows take care of it. If you bleed out, you aren't helping anyone. The skull's voice was uncharacteristically urgent. The young mage hesitated for a second. And in that moment he felt another skeleton go down. There's no time he grunted as he picked up the pace. Now shut up, I need to cast. He had two minions left from the flank defenders, and he sent them ahead to join the fray. In total, he was down to just 11 skeletons. His time away from this side had cost him dearly, the bandits able to push his creations back and pick them off. When he made it to the back ranks, his minions had been forced to give ground to the point they were standing in the courtyard proper. A little further and the bandits would be able to squeeze around them. It would be over if that happened, since Tyron would be trapped in a quickly diminishing circle of undead. His thoughts felt sluggish, his tongue thick in his mouth. Complicated casting might be out of the question, given the condition he was in. Best to keep it simple. Being careful not to be an easy target, he picked out a bandit at random and began to cast fear again. The rebellious farmhands were tiring, but they could sense victory was close. Between the buildings, they were much safer from the archers. If one of the women were to lean out the window to shoot, they made themselves vulnerable to thrown hatchets and knives, which had kept them away so far. All they had to do now was tear apart a few more undead, and they would pour into the courtyard. It was that confidence that Tyron attacked. Like a dagger to the brain, his spell completed and stabbed terror directly into the mind of his hapless victim. Too weak to resist the debilitating effects of the spell, the man began to shake, his eyes staring sightlessly at terrors that were not there. Which is when a skeleton, directed by Tyron, stabbed him right in the gut. As he fell down, clutching at his stomach, the necromancer had already picked out a new target. As he raised his hands and began to cast, he realized with horror just how low his reserves of magic had become. At some point, he'd lost the crystal in his mouth. Perhaps when he'd been knocked down, it didn't matter. With shaking hands, he fumbled another from his pouch and between his teeth. Rather than absorb its energy slowly, he immediately bit down on it, releasing the contained magic within. Push, lads. Almo's there. Monty's voice rose over the din again, and Tyron grimaced. Of course, that foul person was still alive. He'd been hoping to find the man dead when he came back, but no such luck. He tried to spot him in the crowd, hoping to brain the bandit leader with a magic bolt, or even better, pump him full of terror. Unfortunately, Monty was smart enough to stay covered by his goons. Weakened as he was, the excess magic flowing from the shattered crystal in his mouth set Tyron's body shaking. As soon as the energy entered his body, it was pulled out again, fed to the minions in order to keep them moving. In another few minutes, he'd be completely dry, and his skeletons would drop on the spot, unable to sustain themselves. Isn't there anything I can do? He thought desperately. He'd done everything he could to strengthen his minions. But even so, they remain clumsy, slow and fragile. Did he really have to rely on them? One hand pressed into his side to help stem the bleeding, Tyron pushed forward until he stood directly behind the front line of skeletons. Only a few still had shields, the rest stood exposed, stabbing relentlessly, swords gripped tight in their bony fingers, 
He joined them, one good arm stabbing every time he saw an opening, as he ducked and bobbed behind his undead. Over and over again he lashed out, sometimes finding a mark, sometimes not desperate for the fight to end. With the necromancer so exposed to danger, the bandits redoubled their efforts trying to strike him with whatever they had to hand. Hoes turned into spears, machetes used for clearing vegetation, crude swords, and whatever else they'd managed to get their hands on thrust toward him constantly. He did his best to dodge, but he wasn't perfect, getting nicked and sliced several times. At least it takes the pressure off the skeletons. And it did. A minute tick by, then two, and his line held. Two more skeletons had gone down, but the bandits were suffering as well. It was impossible for Tyron to tell, but he felt their numbers were thinning. He couldn't see beyond the few right in front of him as he cursed and spat as he stabbed at them. He was so cold. The final dregs of magic stirred in his guts. He was running empty. He tried to focus, tried to think about what he needed to do, but it was so hard. Stab, duck, stab, duck, stab, duck. That simple pattern consumed all the attention he could muster, and even that was growing impossible. The sword was so heavy in his grip he almost couldn't hold it up anymore. There was screaming and yelling. From where, he couldn't tell. But suddenly there was no one in front of him to stab anymore. He turned to try and see where the bandits had gone. Did they get behind him? Had his magic run out? The skeletons were still standing, though, if only just. The light that burned in their eyes was dim, barely a whiz compared to its normal glow. If the skeletons were still here, then where had the enemy gone? He tried to turn again, but that was the moment his hip decided it had had enough. The pain flared, and he staggered to one side until he ran into the wall and slid down. He ended up sitting, his back resting against the wall, and in that moment, he realized just how far gone he was. He felt like he had ice in his veins, his hands shook constantly, and his vision was starting to blur. He might have done too much. You've had an eventful day, haven't you? A cool voice cut through the fog in his mind. He looked up to see you're staring down at him her lips drawn back to reveal her fangs, eyes burning with wild need. You will die soon if you aren't treated her eyes bored into his, capturing his attention. Are you willing to die, young necromancer? Or will you be born again? Tyron frowned. What did she mean? It was hard to concentrate. He was dimly aware of another voice speaking, someone he knew. Dove. He couldn't make out the words, something about those eyes held him. I don't understand he slurred. The vampire leaned forward. Give me permission, and I will change you into one of us. You will live. Changed, yes. But you will live. The young mage blinked slowly. He wanted to agree. Something told him he should. Those eyes were like fire. What was Dove saying? He was louder now. Maybe it didn't matter. Before he could speak, Tyron slumped to his left as the light faded. Darkness claimed him and he knew no more. Chapter 67 the wheels creaked ominously as they rattled over the half-sunk stones that littered the road. Not for the first time that day, Elsbeth had to slap a hand to her head to keep her hood from falling, and another hand to the post beside her, so she didn't fall from her seat. She'd learned from experience that Munhold wouldn't stop the wagon when she lost her perch, expecting her to catch up and jump back on. Figure it out, yourself seemed to be a way of life for the older woman. Do you think we'll be stopping soon? She asked, working to inject some cheer into her voice. Not long Munhold grunted, Longfield Farmstead about 30 minutes away. Then silence. She was a woman of few words, this priestess of the dark gods. Elsbeth found getting information from her was akin to pulling teeth. Since she'd hoped that this person would be her teacher and mentor, she was endlessly frustrated with her lack of progress. Patience, she schooled herself. If she wasn't being told much, there had to be a reason for that. Maybe she was simply supposed to learn by watching. Except it had been weeks since they had left the village behind. And she had learned almost nothing. Patience is a virtue. But she felt she was quickly running out of hers. In truth, she hadn't learned nothing. The two had spent their time traveling between remote villages and farmsteads. Where they were always welcomed, if somewhat reticently. Munhold would speak to people, tend to illnesses with poultices and herbs that she kept in the wagon, peddle goods and exchange news. In many ways, they were like traveling peddlers, and Elsbeth had found the experience to be pleasant. She met new people, cared for the horses, tum and rum, and slept in the wagon at night. It was peaceful, it was quiet, and she felt she was helping people. 
But what had been shocking had been the number of people they met who spoke to her teacher about the dark gods. Men and women, old and young, came forward to converse with her in hushed and reverent tones asking for blessings, asking for intercession or for prayer. Elsbeth hadn't known what she'd expected to see in the followers of the three. Somehow, she thought they would look different being marked apart from the others, but of course, they weren't. She would never have known of these people's secret faith if she hadn't come in the company of a priestess of the dark, which was also her class now. The revelation, when she had finally completed the status ritual and saw it written down on the page, had been bittersweet. Things had not worked out the way she'd hoped, but she had still found gods who were willing to accept her. Just not among the pantheon she'd worshipped all her life. Have you spent time with these people recently? Elsbeth continued in her dogged attempt to draw her teacher into conversation, the bright smile on her face, showing perhaps a few more teeth than she intended. I haven't seen Longfield for two years, Mumhold replied after thinking for a moment, then fell back into silence. Elsbeth felt her face start to hurt. Is there anything you can tell me about the people we might meet there? She asked cheerfully. She tried to say it cheerfully. Her teacher eyed her for a moment before she snorted. Avery runs the place, generally speaking. He's a good enough sort for a follower of the rot, she said. Elsbeth almost jumped. The other woman seldom mentioned anything to do with the gods without being prompted. Do they tend to have a particular temperament then? The people who worship rot? She spoke as casually as she could, fearful that her teacher would clam up. Munhall grimaced. There's a certain outlook that comes from being close to it. It's not uncommon for farmers who follow the dark to go that way. Any sort of job where your hands are wrist deep in the cycle of life and death tends to have rot worshippers amongst them. Tanners, butchers, lumberers and the sort. Healers too. Healers. Elsbeth was surprised. I thought they would want to avoid decay as much as possible. Everything is in a state of decay, Munhord shook her head, her eyes still on the road before them. From the moment we are born to the moment we die and then well afterward, we are rotting. This goes for all things living or dead. Even stone is subject to erosion, being worn down over time. Nothing is permanent in this realm or any other. It sounds a rather unpleasant way to look at the world Elsbeth hesitated to say. Is there no hope or joy found in creation? Munhold spat over the side of the wagon. Rum flicked her tail at the wet sound. That's nonsense talk of the five. It's not unpleasant or bad or good or anything of the sort. It just is. Talking pretty words like hope and joy don't change what is. It's only when we accept the way of our world that we can start to do something with it. There is no room in the thoughts of the dark ones for wishing. Acknowledge reality and move from there. This was more than the older woman had said on the subject of their shared gods for days, and Elsbeth listened with a keen ear. She didn't always like what she heard about those she served, but she never ignored it. This certainly fit what she knew of them already. The three were cold, indifferent gods, uninterested in changing the day-to-day -day reality of the people who worshipped them. In many ways, they were alien, completely divorced from the human experience that she and others shared with the five divines. It gave her pause. Why do people worship the three? She asked, her voice low and reflective. They don't like to answer prayers. They don't like to help people. What do their followers gain? It was a thought she'd had several times, but hadn't been bold enough to utter out loud. Now that her teacher was in such a talkative mood, she dared to ask for an answer. To her surprise, Munhold actually laughed. She'd never heard this woman laugh in a month. You followers of the five impostors are all the same she wheezed. You view your gods in such a transactional way. What can I get out of it? What's in it for me? How are they going to help and influence my life? Pa. She spat again. Do you expect a real god, a truly divine being, to fly down from the sky and ask for your devotion? To bargain like a street whore? Don't be ridiculous. We worship them because that is what they deserve, and because they are beings of whim. There is no harm in currying favor with beings so much greater than ourselves. The older woman eyed her sideways. They are not above bestowing gifts on those who serve them well, you know. I, for example, received a blessing of the crone many years ago. As much as she wanted to ask, Elsbeth held her tongue. It wasn't her place to ask for such personal information. Even if she burned to know, Munhold watched her wrestle herself for a full minute before she sighed. You're damn nice. I don't think I've ever met a priest or priestess of theirs who was so pleasant in my entire life. She looked pensive for a moment before she shrugged to herself. 
Perhaps that explains their interest in you. They want to make the first ever kind priestess of the dark. I wish that was the reason, Elsbeth muttered. Munhold waited for the girl to elaborate, only to be met with silence. So she clicked her tongue and urged the horses up the broken road. Nearly there she said, you can see the farmhouses up there, clustered around each other. We'd be there already if the roads hadn't been torn up by the kin. Elsbeth grew quiet when the Rift kin were mentioned. They had heard word of the break just in time to seek refuge in a nearby village. It had been a horrible sight. She shuddered to recall it. Wait. Something in Munhold's tone brought her from her introspection. Something's off. When Elsbeth studied the distant buildings more carefully, she could see the damage. Broken window frames. Cracked masonry and shattered tiles evidenced the carnage that had swept through this area. It seems they suffered dreadfully during the break, she said softly. Not that Munhold snapped, look at the fences. She did puzzled. They're broken. Is that shocking? They should be fixed by now. Even right up next to the farmhouses. They haven't been repaired. A very runs a tight ship up here. There's no chance he would have let things lie for this long. With a pull on the reins the horses stopped, and the two priestesses waited and watched the houses in the distance. The younger with a quizzical expression, the other more irritated. Hold on a moment Munhold muttered before she closed her eyes. Communing with the dark gods was nothing like what Elsbeth was used to. Her teacher needed no kneeling or elaborate ceremony to speak with them. In a rare moment of generosity, Munhold had confessed that she didn't so much speak to them as gain an impression of what they wanted to convey, which was usually nothing. She held her breath as the other woman sat, hands folded in her lap and eyes closed, communing with powers older than civilization. Finally, she breathed out a long sigh and urged Tom and Rum on again. There had to be a reason they pulled me out this way, she said. This might be an eye-opening experience for you, girl. Something about her expression told Elsbeth that questions wouldn't be welcome. So she steeled herself and kept her eyes open as they approached. Surprisingly, there were no signs of life within the compound until they were right on top of it. Wait right there. A woman yelled down from the second floor as they entered the shadow of the building. I have an arrow trained on you. Identify yourself. Annette Avery. You should recognize the woman who married you Munhold huffed scowling up at the window. Put that bow down before you hurt yourself. A scrambling could be heard overhead. Is that you, priestess? The same voice asked, shocked. Obviously. Are you going to show your face or am I going to talk to an open window? I'll be right down. A minute later, a red-faced middle-aged woman raced between the buildings to stand beside the horses and stare up at them. A myriad of emotions passed over her face. And then, taking Elsbeth by surprise, she burst into tears. Munhold climbed down from the cart and folded the wailing farm wife in a tender embrace. There, there she said, I can see you've been through a great deal. Let's go inside and you can tell me all about it. No, no, Annette cried, it's the boy. Please, priestess, you have to heal him. Minutes later, they stood over the sweating, pale form of a young man, unconscious in bed. His breath came in shallow gasps as he lolled back and forth, his limbs trembling at the extremities. And six undead skeletons watched them, their eyes burning with purple light. Elsbeth brushed away the tears welling in her eyes as she looked down at Tyron. We have to heal him, she pleaded with her teacher. I know him. The priestess stared at her with hooded eyes. The dark ones are known to grant favors, she said, but always for a price. Chapter 68 Tyron slept. Wild magic, absorbed from the crystals, ran rampant throughout his body. It invaded his muscles, poisoned his blood and tore at his tissues. Without proper treatment, his wounds festered. Waves of heat rolled from his head to his toes, the pain prodding at the edges of his feverish dreams. Magnin clapped him on the shoulder, his face filled with pride. His father slid his blade between his ribs with casual ease while his mother watched, her face cold and impassive. A brand burned into his arm, seared into his flesh against his will. Teeth in his neck, red ambrosia being pushed into his veins. Walls opened up, peeling away like the layers of an onion, whispers and madness, enveloping his twitching form. All of these images and so many more flashed through his awareness, though he did grasp them whole. He felt adrift, the waters sometimes still and sometimes churning with wild frenzy. 
He craved those moments of oblivion, when his consciousness faded to black, and the visions could torment him no more. Rarely, he felt lucid enough to ponder his experience. Had Yor infected him with vampirism? Had the denizens of the abyss damaged his mind? Or was he simply dying? Without proper treatment, his injuries might not have been enough to kill him, given how tough he had become, inhumanly so. But combined with crystal poisoning, he was vulnerable. But such moments of lucidity were few and far between. No sooner had he drawn his thoughts around himself, and begun to see clearly than they were ripped away again, casting him back into the dreams. How long did it go on? He couldn't know, he only knew when it ended. In the grip of a vision in which a pragmatic hacketh carved away his flesh, the butcher deepening him like a fish, Tyron found himself suddenly in control. The delirium faded, as if someone had lanced the boil, and pass were draining out. Before he could appreciate what had happened and organize his thoughts, he shifted. From floating in the darkness, he found himself suddenly in a new place. He couldn't see clearly at first, but as the seconds stretched out, he began to recognize the shapes around him. Trees. Ancient, ferocious trees. Nulled and bent, they nevertheless exuded an inexhaustible tenacity, as if a thousand storms wouldn't be enough to blow them down. Twisted roots broke the dark, loamy soil around their trunks, forming shadows that felt lake deep, just as still and filled with danger. Is this a dream? Or did I just die? Perhaps he'd finally succumbed to his injuries and this was the afterlife. If so, it wasn't what he'd expected, though if anyone should have an idea what they would find after death, it should be a necromancer. He'd have to ask Dove at some point. You're a difficult one to get hold of, young mage. The voice was soft, yet reverberated in the air with a power that couldn't be denied. Tyron whipped around to see a figure standing not three meters away, robed and hooded, its face wreathed in shadows. He tried to speak, only to find he couldn't. No sound came from his throat, no matter how many times he tried. Unfortunately, you may not be permitted to speak in this place, the figure apologized. It is a privilege that you have been brought here at all. But as one who does not follow the Dark Ones, there are limits. Tyron scowled, not permitted to speak. Had he been summoned in dreams to be lectured at, he wished Dove was here, so he could tell this figure of shadows to fuck off. There is much of your parents' attitude in you, the figure chuckled. You share their lack of respect. Let me tell you then, where you are. The thing gestured to the surrounding woods. This place is known by many names, but you may call it the Dark Forest. This realm is the residence of the old gods, the Crone, Raven and Rot. I am their humble messenger. I can't call it anything if I can't speak, Tyron grumbled. And what was that about Magnin and Beery? Have they been here before? He supposed he shouldn't be surprised. The air here felt thick with age and secrets rich in darkness. It smelled like danger and adventure in equal measure. You have not called to the old gods. Despite earning their blessing the messenger continued. You have invited danger down upon you. Danger of the most terrible sort. You will thrive so long as the dark ones find you interesting. But since you have failed to reach out to them, they have begun to grow bored. The messenger leaned forward, and Tyron shrank back from it as its power pressed down on him. Due to your reticence, they have chosen to be more direct. Now that you are here, you may listen to their demands. He could feel them, in that moment, far away. Beyond the horizon, but watching. They loomed at the edges of his awareness, titans staring down on an ant to watch it struggle. In the seat of their power, they can kill me with a thought. He was sure of it. The purpose of the Anathema class is to give you hope of survival, to support you in your growth against the odds the five have stacked against you. It is also to give you an opportunity to decide upon a master. The messenger raised a slender, warped finger and moved it back and forth. You have run out of time to make your decision, so it has been made for you. Swear allegiance to the Dark Ones, abandon any ties to the others, and serve as you are destined to serve. That is their demand. The three titans shifted, oh so slightly, yet waves of power rushed through the forest, bending branches and sending leaves flying, ripped from the branches on which they'd hung. They were leaning in. What the hell is going on? He thought desperately. Why had they brought him here? What was so special about him that they would be so interested? If you agree, in principle, to their request, then you will be healed. Even now, two priestesses of the old gods are by your side. Once you have recovered, perform the ritual and bind yourself to them formally. 
That is the price the messenger whispered gleefully before it waved a hand. An image appeared, fading into existence from the shadows. Golden haired, pale skinned. Someone he remembered well. Elsbeth. I believe this young servant of the old gods is known to you. Should you require any extra persuasion, then know that her life also resides in your hands. If you refuse the generous offer that has been put before you, then she will pay for your insolence. With her life, you piece off. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't speak a word of protest, the air simply wouldn't move in his lungs. Even if he could shout and yell his anger and protest, what good would it do? To the three figures that presided over this place, he was less than powerless. Even their messenger could annihilate him in an instant. They had no need to threaten Elsbeth at all, he was completely within their power, yet they did it anyway. He slumped. He didn't have a choice but to accede to their demands. He looked into the shadow, ready to acknowledge his submission. This is poor form. A new voice emanated through the domain. One that he did not expect. Y'all. And there she was, elegance personified, dressed regally in red, her snow-white skin shining like a beacon in the shadows. She stepped between the trees gracefully and came to stand next to him. He might have found her presence comforting, if not for the beastly glow to her eyes. The messenger grew still at the vampire's approach, disapproval radiating from its warped form. Why are you here, dead thing? You have not been invited. The threat was clear in its tone, and the darkness thickened around them. The forest reacted poorly to yours intrusion, but Tyron welcomed it. Would she be able to extricate him from this situation? He held his breath as she confronted the emissary of the old gods. I would not have needed to come if your patrons had not become so impatient. The anathema class is not granted by them alone. There are three who have a claim to this one. You are breaking the rules. You speak to me of rules the messenger hissed, standing alone in the realm of my gods. They could destroy you in an instant. Indeed, they could you're agreed. And for the first time he noticed a tremor in her voice. She hid it well, but she was afraid. But you have erred in one respect. I did not quite come here alone. The mistress would like a word. She held up a hand and revealed a blood red gem in her hand. The jewel began to shine as a scarlet mist seeped from it, taking shape as a glowering, bloodshot eye. Forgive my intrusion. The voice that emanated from the eye that hung over yours head as a bleeding moon was anything but apologetic, radiating age-old authority and the expectation of being obeyed. The voice alone was almost enough to drive Tyre into his knees. I come as an honored guest it continued to remind you of your obligations. To attain the loyalty of an anathema through such base manipulations is beneath us and against the agreement. The messenger hissed softly, the two points of light deep within its hood narrowed to slits as it glared back at the eye. Your court has no authority in this place it stated, as the ghostly image of Elsbeth dissipated, you cannot prevent us from doing as we wish. You are right, I cannot prevent it yours mistress admitted. But, should you insist on this course of action, I will be forced to inform our other partner of your transgressions. I would be most interested to see what happened next. The messenger radiated fury as it listened to these words. But from the distant titans, Tyron could sense the faintest hint of amusement. The three shifted again and the forest rocked. You and your servant may depart in peace the messenger grated. Yor closed her hand and the gem faded along with the eye. She bowed. Hands clasped together before the vampire too vanished from the forest. You are in luck, boy, the messenger said, all traces of anger gone. The old gods are once again amused. They will allow you to be healed, though they expect you will remember this favor. The creature waved a hand. Wake, it said. And he did. Disoriented and confused, he shot upright in bed, gasping for air as he glanced wildly around. All the panic and terror he had felt in the dark forest rushed through him and he felt as if he would fall back into unconsciousness at any moment. Breathe, Tyron, just breathe a voice said from beside him, and he focused on doing just that. He dragged in slow breaths as his heart slowly calmed, and the trembling in his limbs ceased. His hands found his side, only to recognize that his wound was gone, and his shoulder was fine as well. He'd been healed, just as the messenger had said. I'm so glad you're alright, the person beside him said before two arms were thrown around him and that familiar golden hair was right beneath his nose. Elsbeth, he muttered, why are you here? Is that all you have to say to the person who saved your life? She sniffled, then laughed. 
It's a good thing I arrived when I did. You may not have survived otherwise. I'm surprised you were able to last as long as you did with the injuries you had. She let him go and leaned back, brushing the tears from her eyes. She looked just as she had in his dream, when they'd said she served them. Elsbeth he reached out a hand to rest on her shoulder. What's happened with you? Why aren't you in Foxbridge? She smiled, and despite everything, he felt his heart warm at the sight. There's a bit of a story to tell. Chapter 69 Rufus was always a self-centered prick, but even I didn't expect him to go that far. Elsbeth tried not to wince at the naked dislike in Tyron's tone. She didn't feel much different about Rufus after all that had happened, but somehow it still hurt to think of how her childhood friends had hated each other without her noticing. Was it always like that? She asked, her voice soft. I believed we really were friends, the four of us. I have so many happy memories of the time we spent together. I can't believe it was all a lie. The necromancer blinked, perhaps taken aback by her naivety. Even now, she didn't understand. What else would have to be done to her before she threw away her desire to see the best in people? I wouldn't say that we hated each other he tried to find the words to explain it. More that we were just waiting, wasting time until the awakening. Until you get a class, it's almost as if you haven't been born. All the plans in your head, every ambition you've ever had, every dream. Uh, just that dreams. The four of us hung out together, and I think we genuinely did have good times, but to me, none of that was real. We were just waiting, sitting inside a little bubble. The day of the awakening, that bubble popped, and real life began. He scrubbed a hand through his dark hair. Take Laurel for example. She and Rufus have been sleeping together for years. But does she really care about him? Not really. She was just bored, twiddling her thumbs and waiting for the day her life truly began. He paused for a moment as he recalled just what he was speaking of, and to who. He hung his head. Sorry, I forgot. The last time they met he'd thrown Laurel and Rufus' relationship in her face to upset her, helping him escape as he rattled the swordsman and drove a wedge between them. Elsbeth drew a shuddering breath. It's fine, she said, though her eyes were a little damp. I still can't believe I had no idea. I think you were just too kind to see the three of us for who we really were, Tyron said. Rufus is an angry prick who will do anything to get out from under the thumb of his father. He has big dreams and doesn't care if he hurts people to achieve them. I think you saw him as bright, filled with energy and hope, but you couldn't bring yourself to acknowledge what lay underneath. Laurel is just selfish he chuckled to himself, like a cat. She'll go with the flow as long as she gets what she wants. She's nice enough, good for a laugh, and can get along well with people. But I don't think she invests much of herself in others. She's just chasing the warm spot as the sun moves around. Picturing the tanned forest girl as a lazy feline, fit more than the priestess expected. She smiled as she imagined Laurel hissing, as someone tried to shift her away from the hearth. As for me Tyron smiled a lopsided smile, I was a moody, withdrawn prick who was terrified he wouldn't live up to the expectations he'd put on himself. Any future in which I didn't achieve what my parents had achieved was a complete failure in my eyes. That's a freakishly high bar Elsbeth observed. The Steelums were legendary, famous slayers throughout the province, and perhaps even beyond. Magnin was talked about as possibly the finest swordmaster alive. Trying to live up to that standard was impossible. Which is why I was such a gloomy bastard Tyron confessed. I was terrified, all the time. What do you mean was? A voice rang out from beside the bed in which Tyron sat. Shut up, Dove Tyron rolled his eyes. I'm just saying, you're still a cloud of gloom. You spend more time with dead people than living ones. Of course I do. I'm a fucking necromancer, aren't I? Somehow, I don't think that completely explains it. Tyron Elsbeth broke in, blinking, who was talking. Oh, Tyron paused. Sorry. I've gotten used to having him around. I probably should have introduced you. To who? Elsbeth thought as she looked around. Tyron pointed to the skull that sat on the table beside him. That's Dove, he said. Dove, this is my friend, Elsbeth. It's always nice to meet a beautiful woman. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. The priestess stared at the skull as the eyes glowed with soft purple light, seemingly leering back at her. Dove was a slayer, a summoner Tyron tried to explain. He was going to die. Well, he did die. But I saved him and bound his spirit into his skull. Saved me. 
Dove spat. Imprison me, you mean. You greasy, fuckless twat. I'm only still around because you refuse to release me and allow my soul to find its rightful place at the bosoms of the goddess. Specifically, the right bosom. I had that spot picked out since long ago. Dove, shut up for a minute, or I'll stick you in the manure pile tire and grated. He waited for a moment, and when no further words came from his skull companion, he nodded. You really are a necromancer, Elsbeth said. I couldn't believe it for the longest time, despite seeing the evidence with my own eyes. I just, I couldn't imagine you having to live that kind of life. I always thought you'd be off in a tower somewhere, nose deep in books and never sleeping. The necromancer smiled ruefully. It kind of is like that, except you replace the tower with a room filled with bloody bones. Her eyes widened in shock at the admission. Tyron, she hesitated, you haven't been killing people, have you? He held up his hands and waved them in denial. What? No, I've been working with bones that I've found. That's why I went up to Woodsedge. I was looking for the bones of slayers who'd been lost in the forest. I figured those were the only remains I could get my hands on without anyone realizing what I was doing. She looked at him carefully, her blue eyes staring deep into his own. Well, I did have to kill the bandits here, he admitted, and a few others. I know what you did here to help these women, she said and reached out to take his hand in her own. You did a good thing. I wish nobody had to die, but you protected people who couldn't protect themselves. You shouldn't feel bad about that. Tyron looked down at his hand held so gently in hers and blushed. Ah, thanks. I didn't want to do it, I mean I did want to. Help them, I mean. You were doing so well. Comma he groaned to himself, she touches your hand and you start stumbling. Pathetic. Ahem he pulled his hand free. Anyway, you're a priestess of the old gods, huh? That must be different. She hesitated before nodding slightly. Yes, I don't really know much about them, but they are the gods who accepted me. If I can serve them and help people then I'm satisfied. It's not the kind of priestess I expected to be, but I'm still a priestess. Those gods are willing to sacrifice you in a blink if it gets them what they want. Are you always going to end up tied to something that is happy to throw you away? Yet he couldn't say that. After the pain she went through to get where she was, he refused to throw a wrench in her plans. After all, what would change if he did? Would the old gods allow her to escape their grasp, now that they had her? Not likely. His resolve to avoid contacting them grew even more firm. If they would treat Elsbeth that way, he wanted nothing to do with them. Not that the vampires were much better. Yor had saved him in the dream, but only to serve her own ends. He was caught in a three-way tug of war between players far greater than he. Like a rabbit being fought over by three starving wolves. However it ended, the rabbit never came out well. You're awfully quiet, Elsbeth said. Just thinking. Both of us are on very different paths than we imagined. Rufus and Laurel are pretty much where they wanted to be all along. But the two of us are out in the wilderness with illegal classes. That's true. Although mine only shows as priestess when someone else assesses it. The necromancer's eyes sharpened. Are you saying the old gods can hide a person's status? In a way, I think so. Their servants would never have been able to survive in the empire otherwise. Damnation. He might have to talk to them after all. Although, chances with a court could probably do the same. Vampires would surely be exposed instantly if their status was tested. Yet he knew for a fact that they were able to operate in cities. Yor had hinted as much many times. Perhaps even the Abyss would have a method. Why had he never thought of this before? Because I want to rely on them as little as possible. Who knows what price they would extract in exchange for this knowledge. Yor would demand I become one of them and serve her mistress for a thousand years. The old gods probably want to use my soul as a chew toy or some nonsense. How can anyone know what the Abyss wants? In truth, I haven't learned much yet, Elsbeth confessed. My teacher, Munholt, who I came with is rather close-mouthed. No matter how much I wheedle, she doesn't seem willing to share anything with me. Tyron snorted. Those gods don't strike me as the kind to care much for wheedling. Don't they like the direct approach? She eyed him sideways. How do you know anything about them? I thought they were supposed to be a secret. Though I suppose there are worshippers hidden everywhere. She gasped. Are Magnin and Beery? What? Of course not. Tyron spluttered. They aren't religious in the slightest. Oh. They fell silent for a moment. Well, 
I suppose I'll be able to learn something today. Munhall is holding a burial service for those who died in the fighting. I haven't seen her do one of those before. Tyre instead. She's going to what? He squawked. A burial service. No, she isn't, he said and threw back the blanket. He spun in the bed and planted his feet on the floor, only for his head to spin at the sudden movement. Elsbeth reached for his shoulder to steady him. Careful. You lost a lot of blood. Munhold was able to heal your wounds. But you aren't ready to get up? I don't have time to wait, he replied as he looked beside the bed for his shoes and shirt. In fact, I've already waited too long. If the marshals or slayers catch up to me, then I'm dead. I have to keep moving. You have to heal, Elsbeth insisted. If you run off now, you're only going to fall over in 10 minutes. What do you care about the burial anyway? Because those bodies are mine, she can't have them. He glared at Elsbeth and she withdrew from him, frightened by his sudden intensity. You want their bodies? What for? She asked, wide-eyed. He tried to suppress his impatience as he pulled his boots out from under the bed and shoved his feet into them. Because I'm a necromancer, what do you think I need them for? I lost almost all of my minions in that fight. I have to make more to replace them. Where am I supposed to get the materials that I need? You want me to raid the local graveyard and pull some relatives out of the ground? They aren't materials, those are people. They were people. Bad ones. If I can take what's left of them and turn it into something useful, then that's a good thing. Besides, I need this to continue to advance my class. Without creating minions, without having them fight, I'm stuck. Elsbeth wanted to tell him he could renounce his class if he really wanted to. He could go back to living a regular life, but she knew it was too late for that. Tyron was committed now. I'll go talk to her then she said as she stood. You need to stay in bed. It's fine. I'll tell her myself. He wobbled the moment he stood, but firmed himself and brushed past Elsbeth on his way out the door. Almost without thinking he ordered his remaining skeletons to follow behind, and the minions shuffled out, drawing on his replenishing magic as they did so. He found the priestess in one of the fields outside the courtyard, helping some of the farmwives dig holes for the dead. The bodies were already laid out, most of them bandits, but some were not. He hadn't been able to save everyone, despite his determination. In fact, if Annette and the others hadn't come to the rescue, he would have been killed and the attack might have succeeded. Their courage was incredible. They deserved to be buried with all the honor and dignity that could be mustered. But not the bandits. Some of these belong to me, he said the moment he arrived, not wasting time. The priestess Munholt turned from her digging at the sound of his voice and looked him up and down. You're looking more sprightly than when I saw you last, she drawled. Tyron frowned. Thank you for healing me, he said after a pause. Are you sure it's me you should be thanking? Munholt pointed out, matching him frown for frown. I'll light a candle to the old gods later, he said before he pointed down at the bandits laid out on the ground. But these are mine. I killed them, so I claim the corpses for my own use. Putting them in the ground is a waste. You would deny rot his bounty, Munhold asked. Their flesh belongs to the soil, to break down, be eaten and turned into something new. This is the cycle, boy. The gathered women watched the interplay between the necromancer and the priestess nervously. They didn't want any conflict between these two who they respected. Nor could they ignore the armed skeletons who stood behind Tyron. Despite all he had done for them, they couldn't help but feel fear looking at the merciless undead. In that case, we don't have an issue Tyron encountered. He gestured to the bandits. You can have their flesh every scrap but I want the bones. This means both of us are satisfied, no. Munhold eyed the boy as Elsbeth walked up behind him, looking faintly ill in the presence of so much death. You plan on doing that work yourself, boy? Because I sure as hell ain't going to. Of course not Tyron snorted, I'll butcher them myself. You'll get every bit of flesh and every drop of blood. I guarantee it. You're what? Elsbeth gasped. Munhold held up a hand to silence her apprentice. Fine, she said. We've reached an accord. Rot will be satisfied. And you will have what you need. But you'd best work fast. I want to close over these graves before tomorrow. He only just got up. Elsbeth wanted to protest. You know how badly he was injured. Fine, Tyron stated. I'll start immediately. Without another word, he turned on his heel and left. But the skeletons did not. Instead, they walked to the bodies and, working in pairs, began to drag the bandits away. The survivors sighed with relief, 
glad that the matter had been resolved and tried not to think about what their young savior was about to do. Elsbeth couldn't dismiss it so easily. She walked quickly to catch up with her old friend as he marched back to the building he'd been resting in. Tyron, Tyron, are you really going to to butcher those men? Yes, he said, but that's that's inhuman. That's what I have to do. I can't raise them as skeletons unless I remove the flesh first. I could have turned them into zombies if your teacher hadn't demanded a cut for your god. But I don't like zombies anyway. They're people, Tyron. You can't treat them like some animal. The necromancer rounded on her, and Elsbeth stopped on the spot. Suddenly, the young man, her old friend, that she'd been swapping stories with was gone. Every trace of the shy and awkward Tyron had vanished revealing a cold determined man with no patience for her meddling. That's exactly what they are. Animals, he hissed. Don't dress things up and put on airs, Elsbeth. A person is just an animal who's smart enough to think they're different, but not wise enough to understand they aren't. Those men abandoned any claim to being above beasts, and I'll feel no guilt for treating them as such. She stepped back, appalled at the fury and contempt in his voice. A dead person is just skin, meat and bones, Elsbeth. That's the truth. The moment I'm dead, everything special about me is gone. I don't care if you feed my body to a dog at that point. At least something gets fed. Now, if you don't mind, I suggest you head back over to the other building. You probably don't want to watch what comes next. He turned his back on her and stepped inside, slamming the door behind him. She stood on the spot and watched as the skeletons arrived, dropping the first two bodies on the ground just outside the door, before they turned to retrieve more. From inside, she could hear the rasp of metal on metal, and it took her a moment to realize what was causing it. He's sharpening knives. Her stomach roiled at the thought, and she hurried to get away. Despite her disgust, she found what Tyron had said repeating itself in her mind. It reminded her of what Munhold had said about accepting reality for what it was, about not adding false meaning to a fundamental truth. That's wrong. People believing in it is enough to make it real. A mother's grief for her child is real. The respect we pay to the dead might not make a difference to the deceased, but it does to the living. That makes it worthwhile. She found Munhold still in the field, digging. Elsbeth found a spare shovel and jumped down into the pit with her. That friend of yours is an interesting one, her teacher said. What's involved in a burial dedicated to the old gods? Elsbeth demanded. I want to know. Munhold paused her digging and turned to look at her apprentice, a hint of surprise in her eyes. That's the first time you've asked me directly to teach you, she observed. Elsbeth met her gaze. And, she said, Munhold nodded, and the old gods care only for those who are strong enough to fend for themselves. Listen closely girl, I'll only go through this once. Chapter 70 That friend of yours is awful pretty. I'm trying to work here, Dove. I get that, I get that. I'm just saying that she's pretty. Elsbeth is pretty. Congratulations for noticing the bleeding obvious. What's next? Water is wet. The sky is blue. Your is impossibly sexy. That's quite the compliment. I'm pleased to hear my appearance elicits the desired effect. Oh, shit. Fucking hell, Dove Tyron growled. You knew she was there. I knew no such thing the skull said smugly. Despite his burning embarrassment, Tyron didn't stop moving his hands. It had taken long hours of work to butcher the bodies, and now he was in the process of preparing the bones. That meant painstakingly examining them with magic, cleaning them until they were spotless, kickstarting their infusion with death magic, and doing his best to plug any leaks. He'd already finished working on the skulls, which were sitting in neat rows on a bed upstairs. He had 25 bandit bodies to work with in the end, more than enough to satisfy his needs. He wasn't sure if he would take his numbers back to the 20 he'd had when he was attacked. Perhaps he'd be able to have more after he advanced his class. Right now, he was working on a huge pile of finger bones. The most tedious part of the entire process. If he had to restart, he'd probably slam his head into a wall. He wouldn't stop for anything. I'd almost started to think I was having no effect on you. Nice to see that despite your many gifts, you are still human. Something about the way the vampire spoke felt so intimate. Despite standing across the room, he felt as if she were whispering in his ear. It was more than a little distracting. Stop it. You're, he said, I'm trying to focus. The vampire pouted. I thought you'd be a little more grateful, considering what I had to do for you. 
That's true. I am grateful he stated. Though I do wonder if there may be a cost associated with said help. You're unleashed a throaty chuckle. A vampire's help is never free. It's good that you have begun to recognize this. Didn't you already help him? Dove pointed out. What are you going to do if he doesn't pay you back? Unhelp him. We would simply refuse to help him again in the future. Which would leave me ankle deep in the shit the next time the old gods decided to drop me in it. It's nice to see you understand your predicament, you smiled. Dove was silent for a moment before he spoke up again. Kid, I know I haven't asked too much about it. But can we talk about the weird stuff that's happening with you? You have a ritual to communicate with the abyss. You managed to summon sexy legs over there. And now you're talking about old gods. Whatever the hell those are. I'm a little confused. Tyron continued to work, but flicked his eyes towards Yor, who shrugged slightly. Alright, I'll tell you. This was forced on me, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But it looks like I don't have a choice but to confront the matter. I assume we aren't talking about your necromancer class. No, we're talking about the anathema subclass that I received during my awakening. During, you got a subclass immediately. Tyron nodded grimly. Yes, three patrons bestowed the class on me. The Abyss, the Scarlet Court, the Dark Ones. My first choices were to obtain a ritual that allowed me to contact them, which they pressured me to do every time I used the status ritual. Which explains the shit show in Woodsedge. I nearly died that night Tyron recalled. I could feel them scratching at my mind. He shuddered. Not something I was keen to repeat. I can imagine you're drawled. It's not like talking to the court was much more pleasant. I had to drain half the blood out of my body to get that to work. There's nothing that says it has to be your blood. Right. He rolled his eyes. I'll just sacrifice a virgin next time, shall I? Oh no, that's not necessary at all you chided him. Unless you are trying to contact the truly old ones. They are a little more traditional than the rest of us. Well that's just great. That's a lot to take in Dove said. So if I'm reading the situation right, you are currently beholden to three ancient powers that have an equal claim on you. And some of them are getting impatient. Am I right? Basically, yes. You're fucked. Tyron winced. Thanks Dove. I think I worked that much out for myself. Any chance you can find a way for me to unfuck myself? First, that's a disturbing image. Second, not really. I don't know anything about the court other than what I've learned from closely observing a vampiric friend over there. Yor pulled her shawl a little tighter around herself. And I've never heard of any dark on us. I mean, I can assume a fair bit given the name. But I have no clue what they might want or how to appease them. I notice you didn't mention the Abyss Tyron's brows rose. The skull hesitated to speak. I'm more familiar with that place it's true. But, what happened when you contacted them? You've done it once. Twice. Fuck me, kid. How are you alive? Luck, mostly. The first time was rough. I had to draw the circle in some dust, didn't have a focus, and the ritual wasn't well executed. There were several sigils where, kid, you're shit hot at casting, we get it. Move on. Ah, okay. Basically it felt as if a thousand voices were trying to drill into my head, babbling some sort of nonsense speech I couldn't understand. When I managed to force them out and regain control of myself, I saw a mass of black tentacles forcing their way through the rift. Abyssal? I presume so. I ended the ritual, and that was that. The second time I was much better prepared. I could even interpret the language a little. It felt as if they were communicating in images, flashes of scenes that were difficult to picture or understand. Eventually, I had to force the voices away and end the ritual before anything got through the rift. By Selene's sweet supplicants. That is dangerous magic, kid. You're lucky you weren't driven insane or eaten. Communicating with the abyss is always such a trial you're sniffed, no elegance or decorum at all. It's obvious which of the three is more pleasurable to work with. Putting that aside, look, I'm no expert, but what do you actually know about the abyss? Pretty much nothing Tyron admitted, other than the abyssal entry in my parents' slayer manuals. I've never read anything about it. Right? Well actually, am I alright to tell him this stuff? What do you mean? Tyron frowned. I'm talking to the vampire, kid. Are you going to interfere if I educate him about one of your rivals? 
Not at all you're said. We aren't afraid of healthy competition. All right then. Let me get into a lecturing frame of mind. Just imagine me with a pipe and a drinking problem. Got it. So, the abyss. So the rifts connect this realm to a bunch of other ones, right? Realms that have been overrun with wild magic and turned into monster-making factories, intent on spreading the love. With me so far, everyone knows that much. We always start from the fundamentals. Now, the abyss itself is not a realm. It's not even a place as such. It's kind of like negative space. Tyron frowned as he continued to weave his magic. I'll need help with that one, Dove. Negative space. I'm no expert, like I said. The best way I can frame it is to say that in the places where no realms exist, that's where the abyss is. It's not a realm, or dimension in the sense that we understand them. It's what exists where those things don't. Sounds weird. We are only getting started. Inside the abyss are a host of entities, each of them terrifying in their own little way. Most of them can't physically exist on this side of the veil. Which is why abyssals are so nasty. Because they can. Exactly. And they are a fucking nightmare to kill. But even abyssals are only a medium-sized fish in the nightmare ocean that is the abyss. If you go a little deeper, push out a little further, you can talk to the big boys, the sharks and whales. They're more powerful than abyssals. Heck yes they are. Extremely powerful, and absurdly dangerous. From what I know, not only can they not exist on this side, they can't even speak to anything on this side. Meaning, if you want to talk to them, you have to go in. Fuck. Exactly. And there endeth my knowledge. Every mage who has anything to do with dimension magic learns this much. So we know what to look for in case someone is fucking with forbidden rituals. We are specifically not taught more than that. So we don't start fucking with forbidden rituals. This helps explain why the old gods backed off when the court threatened to tattle on them. They must have a pact with one of these whales in the abyss. Something so powerful even the gods had to check themselves. If he could forge an alliance with something like that. The issue is, what do you have to offer to an entity like that? You're said. You need something to bargain with, something they have need of, otherwise you will simply be devoured. And I suppose you know what that is. I do. I'm even willing to share it if Tyron is happy to acknowledge the favor he owes us. That is all I ask. Done he said decisively. He could already negotiate with the court through Yor, and he could possibly do the same for the gods through Elsbeth or Munhold, but he had to be able to communicate with all three, if he wanted a chance of preserving himself. Yor's lips peeled back to reveal a fang-filled grin. Souls, she said. They love souls. Tyron sat at the table and buried his head in his hands. It was well past midnight now, the flickering candlelight the only thing illuminating the empty dining room. That and Dove's eyes. He was getting faster at every aspect of minion creation, including the butchering. But it was still a time-consuming process, especially if he wanted to do it right. These bones were his last chance to improve and refine his skills, before he committed to the status ritual and advanced his class. Everything had to be perfect. You don't have a lot of time, Kid Dove reminded him. This place is going to get hot soon. And I don't mean in a sexy way. The weary necromancer lifted his head and rubbed vigorously at his eyes, trying to wipe away the sandy feeling he got every time he blinked. I know. I should be leaving tomorrow morning, if I want to be safe. The slayers can't be far away. Or the marshals. Heading up to the mountains and laying low for a while is your best bet. Only problem being... I won't have access to the materials I need, unless I make the most out of what I have here. I can't advance my class with confidence. Bingo. It might be worth holding off for a day in order to make preparations. Something to think about. Just what I needed. His body cried out for rest. He still hadn't fully recovered despite whatever healing Munhold had done, and he was bone weary on top. He had to sleep. With the bones properly prepared and in the process of saturating upstairs, all he could do was wait anyway. I'm heading to bed he said as he stood, then paused. Any idea where you went? Why? You thinking of inviting her to your boudoir? I still want to live, thanks. I was just curious. I have no idea. It's not easy for me to keep track of stuff in my current condition. Fair enough Tyron yawned. See you in the morning. He raised his palm and created a globe of a light before blowing out the candles about the room. He wouldn't have many more nights in a proper bed. He had to enjoy them while he could. A gentle tapping sounded from the door. Tyron, are you awake? 
He turned to the door, surprised. Normally nobody bothered him in this house. The widows and children were happy to give the necromancer his space. Elsbeth, he called. Is that you? Are you going to let me in or leave me on the doorstep in the dark? She replied. The chair clattered to the floor as he stood in a hurry, and made his way to the door with haste. Sorry about that he said as he saw her standing in the dark. Usually no one drops in on me when I'm working. The priestess hesitated for a moment as she entered the building, before firming her resolve and stepping through. Thankfully, she didn't see any evidence of Tyron's work in the room. She'd been afraid that she'd find in truth her imagination hadn't been sure where to go. Would she find Tyron wrist deep in cadavers, covered in blood and gore? She'd envisioned him grinding bones to powder, and doing God's knows what with it. Looking for the bloodstains, he asked as he noticed her glancing about. Oh, ah, a bit, yes. I'm sorry. Don't be Tyron shrugged. I don't like it. But this is what I have to do if I want to continue in my class. It's disgusting, and I threw up the first few times I did it. Turns out you can get used to just about anything. We buried what you brought us she told him, or at least, what your skeletons brought us. I presume that was all the the, the flesh. He chuckled. Yes, I kept the bones and put them upstairs. There is a process that they will go through before I can raise them as minions. He invited her to sit at the table, and summoned a few light globes to illuminate the room. Thankfully, he packed away his butchering tools and cleaned up. The room had looked far more macabre a few hours ago. He'd learned quickly that you needed to be thorough in these things. The stench of rotting flesh wasn't something he particularly enjoyed. It's hard for me to imagine that this is your life now, Elspeth admitted, chopping up corpses, using magic on human bones. It's not exactly what I envisioned for myself. Either he wearily smiled, but it is what it is. This is the class I was given, so I'm going to make the best of it. I can help people as a necromancer, just like I help the survivors here. I can fight in the rifts, kill monsters, save lives. If I get strong enough, do enough good, then they'll have to accept me. He spoke with such confidence that Elsbeth almost believed him. But in the back of her mind, she couldn't forget the reason she had been rejected by the Divines. It was Tyron. The messenger had told her point blank that he was the cause, though she had no idea why. The five had turned her life upside down simply because she was his friend. What would they do to Tyron to make sure he was never able to succeed? I hope that comes true, she said. You've done so much already. The women here, they suffered terribly. If you hadn't come well, I'm glad you did. He nodded. Me too, he said. The two fell into a companionable silence for a few minutes. For a short while. It felt like old times, spending time together without a purpose in mind as good friends did. It was pleasant. Elsbeth was the one person Tyron felt comfortable enough around to let his guard down, and he'd missed being able to properly relax in the presence of another person. I wanted to apologize, Elsbeth spoke up. I didn't mean to attack you over the bodies of the bandits. I was just shocked, I suppose. I knew intellectually what being a necromancer meant. But being confronted with the reality of it took me by surprise. I'm sorry. She looked directly into his eyes as she spoke, and he could see she meant it. He brushed a hand through his hair and felt mildly embarrassed. It's fine. I shouldn't have snapped at you the way I did. As I said, I had a hard time adjusting to it when I was starting. There's no reason why you should be any different. Elsbeth smiled, pleased to see her friend had returned. What do you plan to do now? Are you going to stay a bit longer and help protect these people? He shook his head. I wish I could, he said regretfully. The Slayers will be clearing out the kin who came through the area after the break, and the Marshals will be shortly behind them. I might be doing my best to help people, but I'm still illegal. If they catch up to me, I'll be dead. What a terrible way to live, Elsbeth thought, and her sense of injustice rose. He hasn't harmed anyone, only the class is illegal. And who decides what makes a class illegal anyway? What someone does with what they've been given is the only thing that should matter. Do you, she hesitated, want me to come with you? I could help. That wouldn't be right. You need to stick with your teacher and advance your class. You won't be able to do that with me. What do you have to do to advance as priestess of them, anyway? Elsbeth sighed and leaned back in her chair. Tend to the faithful and perform miracles of your gods, she quoted, whatever that means. Miracles? Do you have any spells? I had a choice of a few minor things at level 2, cantrips I suppose you can call them. What did you pick? Don't laugh. 
I'm not going to laugh. I have a spell that helps preserve food. That's useful. Is it? Of course. They continued to joke back and forth, and for just a moment, they were able to forget all that had changed. This is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you for your supportive comments. Have a wonderful rest of the day. The silent rupt is out.